Preface to Mr. Harrison's Confessions by Elizabeth Gaskell I have just taken up, by chance, an old number of the Edinburgh Review, April 1848, in which it is said that Southey had proposed to himself to write a history of English domestic life. I will not enlarge upon the infinite loss we have had in the non-fulfilment of this plan. Everyone must in some degree feel its extent who has read those charming glimpses of home scenes contained in the early volumes of The Doctor, etc. This quarter of an hour's chance reading has created a wish in me to put upon record some of the details of country town life either observed by myself or handed down to me by older relations for even in small towns scarcely removed from villages the phases of society are rapidly changing and much will appear strange which yet occurred only in the generation immediately preceding ours i must however say before going on that although i choose to disguise my own identity and to conceal the name of the town to which i refer every circumstance and occurrence which i shall relate is strictly and truthfully told without exaggeration as for classing the details with which i am acquainted under any heads that will be impossible from their heterogeneous nature i must write them down as they arise in my memory the town in which i once resided is situated in a district inhabited by large landed proprietors of very old family the daughters of these families if unmarried retired to live in x on their annuities and gave the tone to the society there stately ladies they were remembering etiquette and precedence in every occurrence of life and having their genealogy at their tongue's end then there were the widows of the cadets of these same families also poor and also proud but i think more genial and less given to recounting their pedigrees than the former then came the professional men and their wives who were more wealthy than the ladies i have named but who always treated them with deference and respect sometimes even amounting to obsequiousness for was there not my brother sir john a and my uncle mr x of y to give employment and patronage to the doctor or the attorney a grade lower came a class of single or widowed ladies and again it was possible not to say probable that their pecuniary circumstances were in better condition than those of the aristocratic dames who nevertheless refused to meet in general society the ci devant housekeepers or widows of stewards who had been employed by their fathers and brothers they would occasionally condescend to ask mason or that good bentley to a private tea-drinking at which i doubt not much gossip relating to former days at the hall would pass but that was patronage to associate with them at another person's house would have been an acknowledgment of equality below again came the shopkeepers who dared to be original who gave comfortable suppers after the very early dinners of that day not checked by the honourable mr d s precedent of a seven o'clock tea on the most elegant and economical principles and a supperless turn-out at nine there were the usual respectable and disrespectable poor and hanging on the outskirts of society were a set of young men ready for mischief and brutality and every now and then dropping off the pit's brink into crime the habits of this class about forty years ago were much as those of the mohawks a century before they would stop ladies returning from the card parties which were the staple gaiety of the place and who were only attended by a maid-servant bearing a lantern and whip them literally whip them as you whip a little child until administering such chastisement to a good 
precise old lady of high family my brother the magistrate came forward and put down such proceedings with a high hand certainly there was more individuality of character in those days than now no one even in a little town of two thousand inhabitants would now be found to drive out with a carriage full of dogs each dressed in the male or female fashion of the day as the case might be each dog provided with a pair of house shoes for which his carriage boots were changed on his return no old lady would be so oblivious of mrs grundy's existence now as to dare to invest her favourite cow after its unlucky fall into a lime pit in flannel waistcoat and drawers in which the said cow paraded the streets of x to the day of its death there were many regulations which were strictly attended to in the society of x and which probably checked more manifestations of eccentricity before a certain hour in the morning calls were never paid nor yet after a certain hour in the afternoon the consequence was that everybody was out calling on everybody at the same time for it was de rigueur that morning calls should be returned within three days and accordingly making due allowance for our proportion of rain in england every fine morning was given up to this employment a quarter of an hour was the limit of a morning call before the appointed hour of reception i fancied the employment of many of the ladies was fitting up their laces and muslins which for the information of all those whom it may concern were never ironed but carefully stretched and pinned thread by thread with most lilliputian pieces on a board covered with flannel most of these scions of quality had many pounds worth of valuable laces descended to them from mothers and grandmothers which must be got up by no hands as you may guess but those of fairly fair indeed when muslin and net were a guinea a yard this was not to be wondered at the lace was washed in buttermilk which gave rise to an odd little circumstance one lady left her lace basted up in some not very sour buttermilk and unluckily the cat lapped it up lace and all one would have thought the lace would have choked her but so it was the lace was too valuable to be lost so a small dose of tartar emetic was administered to the poor cat the lace returned to view was carefully darned and decked the good lady's best cap for many a year after and many a time did she tell the story gracefully bridling up in a prim sort of way and giving a little cough as if preliminary to a rather improper story the first sentence of it was always i remember i do not think you can guess where the lace on my cap has been dropping her voice in pussy's inside my dear the dinner hour was three o'clock in all houses of any pretensions to gentility and a very late hour it was considered to be soon after four one or two inveterate card players might be seen in calash and patterns picking their way along the streets to the house where the party of the evening was to be held as soon as they arrived and had unpacked themselves an operation of a good half hour's duration in the dining parlour they were ushered into the drawing-room where unless in the very height of summer it was considered a delicate attention to have the shutters closed the curtains drawn and the candles lighted the card tables were set out each with two new packs of cards for which it was customary to pay each person placing a shilling under one of the candlesticks the ladies settled down to preference and allowed of no interruption even the tea-trays were placed on the middle of the card-tables and tea hastily gulped down with a few remarks on the good or ill fortune of the evening new arrivals were greeted with nods in the intervals of the game and as people entered the room they were pounced upon by the lady of the house to form another table 
cards were a business in those days not a recreation their very names were to be treated with reverence someone came to x from a place where flippancy was in fashion he called the knave jack and everybody looked grave and voted him vulgar but when he was overheard calling preference the decorous highly respectable game of preference pref why what course remained for us but to cut him and cut him we did about half past eight notices of servants having arrived for their respective mistresses were given the games were concluded accounts settled a few parting squibs and cracks let off at careless or unlucky partners and the party separated by ten o'clock all was in bed and asleep i have made no mention of gentlemen at these parties because if ever there was an amazonian town in england it was x eleven widows of respectability at one time kept house there besides spinsters innumerable the doctor preferred his armchair and slippers to the forms of society such as i have described and so did the attorney who was besides not insensible to the charms of a hot supper indeed i suppose it was because of the small incomes of the more aristocratic portion of our little society not sufficing both for style and luxury but it was a fact that as gentility decreased good living increased in proportion we had the honour and glory of looking at old plate and delicate china at the comil faux tea parties but the slices of bread and butter were like wafers and the sugar for coffee was rather of the brownest still there was much gracious kindness among our haut volet in those times good mr rigmarole carriages were carriages and there were not the infinite variety of brooms droskies etc etc down to a wheelbarrow which now make locomotion easy nor yet were there cars and cabs and flies ready for hire in our little town a post-chaise was the only conveyance besides the sedan chair of which more anon so the widow of an earl's son who possessed a proper old-fashioned coach and pair would on rainy nights send her carriage the only private carriage of x round the town picking up all the dowagers and invalids and conveying them dry and safe to and from their evening engagement the various other ladies who in virtue of their relations holding manners and maintaining gamekeepers had frequent presents during the season of partridges pheasants etc etc would daintily carve off the titbits and putting them carefully into a hot basin bid betty or molly cover it up quickly and carry it to mrs or miss so-and-so whose appetite was but weakly and who required dainties to tempt it which she could not afford to purchase these poorer ladies had also their parties in turn they were too proud to accept invitations if they might not return them although various and amusing were their innocent makeshifts and imitations to give you only one instance i remember a card party at one of these good ladies lodgings where when tea-time arrived the ladies sitting on the sofa had to be displaced for a minute in order that the tea-trays plates of cake bread and butter and all might be extricated from their concealment under the valences of the couch you may imagine the subjects of the conversation amongst these ladies cards servants relations pedigrees and last and best much mutual interest about the poor of the town to whom they were one and all kind and indefatigable benefactresses cooking sewing for advising doctoring doing everything but educating them one or two old ladies dwelt on the glories of former days when x boasted of two earl's daughters as residents though it must be sixty years since they died there are traces of their characters yet lingering about the place 
proud precise and generous bitter tories they were their sister had married a general more distinguished for a successful comedy than for his mode of conducting the war in america and consequently his sisters-in-law held the name of washington in deep abhorrence i can fancy the way in which they must have spoken of him from the shudder of abomination with which their devoted admirers spoke years afterwards of that man washington lady jane was moreover a benefactress to x before her day the pavement of the footpaths was composed of loose round stones placed so far apart that a delicate ankle might receive a severe wrench from slipping between but she left a sum of money in her will to make and keep in repair a flag pavement on condition that it should only be broad enough for one to walk abreast in order to put a stop to the indecent custom coming into vogue of ladies linking with gentlemen linking being the old-fashioned word for walking arm in arm lady jane also left her sedan and money to pay the bearers for the use of the ladies of x who were frequently like adam and eve in the weather glass in consequence the first arrival at a party having to commence the order of returning when the last lady was only just entering upon the gaieties of the evening the old ladies were living hordes of family tradition and old custom one of them a shropshire woman had been to school in london about the middle of the last century the journey from shropshire took her a week at the school to which she was sent besides fine work of innumerable descriptions pastry and the art of confectionery were taught to those whose parents desired it the dancing master gave his pupils instruction in the art of using a fan properly although an only child she had never sat down in her parents presence without leave until she was married and spoke with infinite disgust of the modern familiarity with which children treated their parents in my days said she when we wrote to our fathers and mothers we began honoured sir or honoured madam none of your dear mamas or dear papas would have been permitted and we ruled off our margin before beginning our letters instead of cramming writing into every corner of the paper and when we ended our letters we asked our parents blessing if we were writing to them and if we wrote to a friend we were content to remain your affectionate friend instead of hunting up some new-fangled expression such as your attached your loving etc fanny my dear i got a letter to-day signed yours cordially like a dram shop what will this world come to then she would tell how a gentleman having asked her to dance in her youth never thought of such familiarity as offering her his arm to conduct her to her place but taking up the flap of his silk-lined coat he placed it over his open palm and on it the lady daintily rested the tips of her fingers to be sure my dear old lady once confessed to a story neither so pretty nor so proper namely that one of the amusements of her youth was measuring noses with some gentleman not an uncommon thing in those days and as lips lie below noses such measurements frequently ended in kisses at her house there was a little silver basket strainer and once remarking on this she showed me a silver saucer pierced through with holes and told me it was a relic of the times when tea was first introduced into england after it had been infused and the beverage drank the leaves were taken out of the teapot and placed on this strainer and then eaten by those who liked with sugar and butter and very good they were she added another relic which she possessed was an old receipt book dating back to the middle of the sixteenth century our grandmothers must have been strong-headed women for there were numerous receipts for ladies beverages etc generally beginning with take a gallon of brandy or any other spirit the puddings too were no light matters 
one receipt which i copied for the curiosity of the thing begins with take thirty eggs two quarts of cream etc these brobdingnagian puddings she explained by saying that the afternoon meal before the introduction of tea generally consisted of cakes and cold puddings together with a glass of what we should now call liqueur but which was then denominated bitters the same old lady advocated strongly the manner in which marriages were formerly often brought about a young man went up to london to study for the bar to become a merchant or what not and arrived at middle age without having thought about matrimony when finding himself rich and desirous of being married he would frequently write to some college friend or to the clergyman of his native place asking him to recommend a wife whereupon the friend would send a list of suitable ladies the bachelor would make his selection and empower his friend to wait upon the parents of the chosen one who accepted or refused without much consultation of their daughter's wishes often the first intelligence she had of the affair was by being told by her mother to adorn herself in her best as the gentleman her parents proposed for her husband was expected by the night coach to supper and very happy marriages they turned out my dear very my venerable informant would add sighing i always suspected that her own had been of this description chapter one the fire was burning gaily my wife had just gone upstairs to put baby to bed charles sat opposite to me looking very brown and handsome it was pleasant enough that we should feel sure of spending some weeks under the same roof a thing which we had never done since we were mere boys i felt too lazy to talk so i ate walnuts and looked into the fire but charles grew restless now that your wife is gone upstairs will you must tell me what i've wanted to ask you ever since i saw her this morning tell me all about the wooing and winning i want to have the receipt for getting such a spicy little wife of my own your letters only gave the barest details so set to man and tell me every particular if i tell you all it will be a long story never fear if i get tired i can go to sleep and dream that i am back again a lonely bachelor in ceylon and i can waken up when you have done to know that i am under your roof dash away man once upon a time a gallant young bachelor there's a beginning for you well then once upon a time a gallant young bachelor was sorely puzzled where to settle when he had completed his education as a surgeon i must speak in the first person i cannot go on as a gallant young bachelor i had just finished walking the hospitals when you went to ceylon and if you remember i wanted to go abroad like you and thought of offering myself as a ship surgeon but i found i should rather lose caste in my profession so i hesitated and while i was hesitating i received a letter from my father's cousin mr morgan that old gentleman who used to write such long letters of good advice to my mother and who tipped me a five-pound note when i agreed to be bound apprentice to mr howard instead of going to sea well it seems the old gentleman had all along thought of taking me as his partner if i turned out pretty well and as he heard a good account of me from an old friend of his who was a surgeon at guy's he wrote to propose this arrangement i was to have a third of the profits for five years after that half and eventually i was to succeed to the whole it was no bad offer for a penniless man like me as mr morgan had a capital country practice and though i did not know him personally i had formed a pretty good idea of him as an honourable kind-hearted fidgety meddlesome old bachelor 
and a very correct notion it was as i found out in the very first half hour of seeing him i had had some idea that i was to live in his house as he was a bachelor and a kind of family friend and i think he was afraid that i should expect this arrangement for when i walked up to his door with the porter carrying my portmanteau he met me on the steps and while he held my hand and shook it he said to the porter jerry if you'll wait a moment mr harrison will be ready to go with you to his lodgings at jocelyn's you know and then turning to me he addressed his first words of welcome i was a little inclined to think him inhospitable but i got to understand him better afterwards jocelyn's said he is the best place i have been able to hit upon in a hurry and there is a good deal of fever about which made me desirous that you should come this month a low kind of typhoid in the oldest part of the town i think you'll be comfortable there for a week or two i have taken the liberty of desiring my housekeeper to send down one or two things which give the place a little more of a home aspect an easy chair a beautiful case of preparations and one or two little matters in the way of eatables but if you'll take my advice i've a plan in my head which we will talk about to-morrow morning at present i don't like to keep you standing out on the steps here so i'll not detain you from your lodgings where i rather think my housekeeper is gone to get tea ready for you i thought i understood the old gentleman's anxiety for his own health which he put upon care for mine for he had on a kind of loose grey coat and no hat on his head but i wondered that he did not ask me indoors instead of keeping me on the steps i believe after all i made a mistake in supposing he was afraid of taking cold he was only afraid of being seen in deshabille and for his apparent inhospitality i had not been long in duncombe before i understood the comfort of having one's house considered as a castle into which no one might intrude and saw a good reason for the practice mr morgan had established of coming to his door to speak to every one it was only the effect of habit that made him receive me so before long i had the free run of his house there was every sign of kind attention and forethought on the part of some one whom i could not doubt to be mr morgan in my lodgings i was too lazy to do much that evening and sat in the little bow window which projected over jocelyn's shop looking up and down the street duncombe calls itself a town but i should call it a village really looking from jocelyn's it is a very picturesque place the houses are anything but regular they may be mean in their details but altogether they look well they have not that flat unrelieved front which many towns of far more pretensions present here and there a bow window every now and then a gable cutting up against the sky occasionally a projecting upper story throws good effect of light and shadow along the street and they have a queer fashion of their own of colouring the whitewash of some of the houses with a sort of pink blotting paper tinge more like the stone of which mayence is built than anything else it may be very bad taste but to my mind it gives a rich warmth to the colouring then here and there a dwelling-house has a court in front with a grass plot on each side of the flagged walk and a large tree or two limes or horse chestnuts which send their great projecting upper branches over into the street making round dry places of shelter on the pavement in the times of summer showers while i was sitting in the bow window thinking of the contrast between this place and the lodgings in the heart of london which i had left only twelve hours before the window open here and although in the centre of the town admitting only scents from the mignonette boxes on the sill instead of the dust and smoke of x street 
the only sound heard in this the principal street being the voices of mothers calling their playing children home to bed and the eight o'clock bell of the old parish church bim-bombing in remembrance of the curfew while i was sitting thus idly the door opened and the little maid-servant dropping a curtsey said please sir mrs munton's compliments and she would be glad to know how you are after your journey there was not that hearty and kind would even the dearest chum i had at guy's have thought of doing such a thing while mrs munton whose name i had never heard of before was doubtless suffering anxiety till i should relieve her mind by sending back word that i was pretty well my compliments to mrs munton and i am pretty well much obliged to her it was as well to say only pretty well for very well would have destroyed the interest mrs munton evidently felt in me good mrs munton kind mrs munton perhaps also young handsome rich widowed mrs munton i rubbed my hands with delight and amusement and resuming my post of observation began to wonder at which house mrs munton lived again the little tap and the little maid-servant please sir miss tomkinson's compliments and they would be glad to know how you feel yourself after your journey i don't know why but miss tomkinson's name had not such a halo about it as mrs munton's still it was very pretty in miss tomkinson's to send and inquire i only wished i did not feel so perfectly robust i was almost ashamed that i could not send word i was quite exhausted by fatigue and had fainted twice since my arrival if i had but had a headache at least i heaved a deep breath my chest was in perfect order i had caught no cold so i answered again much obliged to the miss tomkinsons i am not much fatigued tolerably well my compliments little sally could hardly have got downstairs before she returned bright and breathless mr and mrs bullock's compliments sir and they hope you are pretty well after your journey who would have expected such kindness from such an unpromising name mr and mrs bullock were less interesting it is true than their predecessors but i graciously replied my compliments a night's rest will perfectly recruit me the same message was presently brought up from one or two more unknown kind hearts i really wished i were not so ruddy looking i was afraid i should disappoint the tender-hearted town when they saw what a hale young fellow i was and i was almost ashamed of confessing to a great appetite for supper when sally came up to inquire what i would have beefsteaks were so tempting but perhaps i ought rather to have water gruel and go to bed the beefsteak carried the day however i need not have felt such a gentle elation of spirits as this mark of the town's attention is paid to every one when they arrive after a journey many of the same people have sent to inquire after you great hulking brown fellow as you are only sally spared you the infliction of devising interesting answers chapter two the next morning mr morgan came before i had finished breakfast he was the most dapper little man i ever met i see the affection with which people cling to the style of dress that was in vogue when they were bows and bells and received the most admiration they are unwilling to believe that their youth and beauty are gone and think that the prevailing mode is unbecoming mr morgan will inveigh by the hour together against frock coats for instance and whiskers he keeps his chin close shaven wears a black dress coat and dark grey pantaloons 
and in his morning round to his town patients he invariably wears the brightest and blackest of hessian boots with dangling silk tassels on each side when he goes home about ten o'clock to prepare for his ride to see his country patients he puts on the most dandy top boots i ever saw which he gets from some wonderful bootmaker a hundred miles off his appearance is what one calls jemmy there is no other word that will do for it he was evidently a little discomfited when he saw me in my breakfast costume with the habits which i brought with me from the fellows at guy's my feet against the fireplace my chair balanced on its hind legs a habit of sitting which i afterwards discovered he particularly abhorred slippers on my feet which also he considered a most ungentlemanly piece of untidiness out of a bedroom in short from what i afterwards learned every prejudice he had was outraged by my appearance on this first visit of his i put my book down and sprang up to receive him he stood hat and cane in hand i came to inquire if it would be convenient for you to accompany me on my morning's round and to be introduced to a few of our friends i quite detected the little tone of coldness induced by his disappointment at my appearance though he never imagined that it was in any way perceptible i will be ready directly sir said i and bolted into my bedroom only too happy to escape his scrutinizing eye when i returned i was made aware by sundry indescribable little coughs and hesitating noises that my dress did not satisfy him i stood ready hat and gloves in hand but still he did not offer to set off on our round i grew very red and hot at length he said excuse me my dear young friend but may i ask if you have no other coat besides that cutaway i believe you call them we are rather sticklers for propriety i believe in duncombe and much depends on the first impression let it be professional my dear sir black is the garb of our profession forgive my speaking so plainly but i consider myself in loco parentis he was so kind so bland and in truth so friendly that i felt it would be most childish to take offence but i had a little resentment in my heart at this way of being treated however i mumbled oh certainly sir if you wish it and returned once more to change my coat my poor cutaway those coats sir give a man rather too much of a sporting appearance not quite befitting the learned professions more as if you came down here to hunt than to be the galen or hippocrates of the neighbourhood he smiled graciously so i smothered a sigh for to tell you the truth i had rather anticipated and in fact had boasted at guys of the runs i hoped to have with the hounds for duncombe was in a famous hunting district but all these ideas were quite dispersed when mr morgan led me to the inn-yard where there was a horse-dealer on his way to a neighbouring fair and strongly advised me which in our relative circumstances was equivalent to an injunction to purchase a little useful fast-trotting brown cob instead of a fine showy horse who would take any fence i put him to as the horse-dealer assured me mr morgan was evidently pleased when i bowed to his decision and gave up all hopes of an occasional hunt he opened out a great deal more after this purchase he told me his plan of establishing me in a house of my own which looked more respectable not to say professional than being in lodgings and then he went on to say that he had lately lost a friend a brother surgeon in a neighbouring town who had left a widow with a small income who would be very glad to live with me and act as mistress to my establishment thus lessening the expense 
she is a ladylike woman said mr morgan to judge from the little i have seen of her about forty-five or so and may really be of some help to you in the little etiquettes of our profession the slight delicate attentions which every man has to learn if he wishes to get on in life this is mrs munton's sir said he stopping short at a very unromantic looking green door with a brass knocker i had no time to say who is mrs munton before we had heard mrs munton was at home and were following the tidy elderly servant up the narrow carpeted stairs into the drawing-room mrs munton was the widow of a former vicar upwards of sixty rather deaf but like all the deaf people i had ever seen very fond of talking perhaps because she then knew the subject which passed out of her grasp when another began to speak she was ill of a chronic complaint which often incapacitated her from going out and the kind people of the town were in the habit of coming to see her and sit with her and of bringing her the newest freshest tidbits of news so that her room was the centre of the gossip of duncombe not of scandal mind for i make a distinction between gossip and scandal now you can fancy the discrepancy between the ideal and the real mrs munton instead of any foolish notion of a beautiful blooming widow tenderly anxious about the health of the stranger i saw a homely talkative elderly person with a keen observant eye and marks of suffering on her face plain in manner and dress but still unmistakably a lady she talked to mr morgan but she looked at me and i saw that nothing i did escaped her notice mr morgan annoyed me by his anxiety to show me off but he was kindly anxious to bring about every circumstance to my credit in mrs munton's hearing knowing well that the town crier had not more opportunities to publish all about me than she had what was that remark you repeated to me of sir astley cooper's asked he it had been the most trivial speech in the world that i had named as we walked along and i felt ashamed of having to repeat it but it answered mr morgan's purpose and before night all the town had heard that i was a favourite pupil of sir astley's i had never seen him but twice in my life and mr morgan was afraid that as soon as he knew my full value i should be retained by sir astley to assist him in his duties as surgeon to the royal family every little circumstance was pressed into the conversation which could add to my importance as i once heard sir robert peel remark to mr harrison the father of our young friend here the moons in august are remarkably full and bright if you remember charles my father was always proud of having sold a pair of gloves to sir robert when he was staying at the grange near biddicombe and i suppose good mr morgan had paid his only visit to my father at the time but mrs munton evidently looked at me with double respect after this incidental remark which i was amused to meet with a few months afterwards disguised in the statement that my father was an intimate friend of the premier's and had in fact been the adviser of most of the measures taken by him in public life i sat by half indignant and half amused mr morgan looked so complacently pleased at the whole effect of the conversation that i did not care to mar it by explanations and indeed i had little idea at the time how small sayings were the seeds of great events in the town of duncombe when we left mrs munton's he was in a blandly communicative mood you will find it a curious statistical fact but five-sixths of our householders of a certain rank in duncombe are women we have widows and old maids in rich abundance in fact my dear sir i believe that you and i are almost the only gentlemen in the place mr bullock of course excepted 
by gentlemen i mean professional men it behooves us to remember sir that so many of the female sex rely upon us for the kindness and protection which every man who is worthy of the name is always so happy to render miss tomkinson where we next called did not strike me as remarkably requiring protection from any man she was a tall gaunt masculine looking woman with an air of defiance about her naturally this however she softened and mitigated as far as she was able in favour of mr morgan he it seemed to me stood a little in awe of the lady who was very brusque and plain-spoken and evidently piqued herself on her decision of character and sincerity of speech so this is the mr harrison we have heard so much of from you mr morgan i must say from what i had heard that i had expected something a little more um um but he's young yet he's young we have been all anticipating an apollo mr harrison from mr morgan's description and an Esculapius combined in one or perhaps i might confine myself to saying apollo as he i believe was the god of medicine how could mr morgan have described me without seeing me i asked myself miss tomkinson put on her spectacles and adjusted them on her roman nose suddenly relaxing from her severity of inspection she said to mr morgan but you must see caroline i had nearly forgotten it she is busy with the girls but i will send for her she had a bad headache yesterday and looked very pale it made me very uncomfortable she rang the bell and desired the servant to fetch miss caroline miss caroline was the younger sister younger by twenty years and so considered as a child by miss tomkins who was fifty-five at the very least if she was considered as a child she was also petted and caressed and cared for as a child for she had been left as a baby to the charge of her elder sister and when the father died and they had had to set up a school miss tomkins took upon herself every difficult arrangement and denied herself every pleasure and made every sacrifice in order that carrie might not feel the change in their circumstances my wife tells me she once knew the sisters purchase a piece of silk enough with management to have made two gowns but carrie wished for flounces or some such falals and without a word miss tomkins gave up her gown to have the whole made up as carrie wished into one handsome gown and wore an old shabby affair herself as cheerfully as if it were genoa velvet that tells the sort of relationship between the sisters as well as anything and i consider myself very good to name it thus early for it was long before i found out miss tomkinson's real goodness and we had a great quarrel first miss caroline looked very delicate and die away when she came in she was as soft and sentimental as miss tomkinson was hard and masculine she had a way of saying oh sister how can you at miss tomkinson's startling speeches which i never liked especially as it was accompanied by a sort of protesting look at the company present as if she wished to have it understood that she was shocked at her sister's outre manners now that was not faithful between sisters a remonstrance in private might have done good though for my own part i have grown to like miss tomkinson's speeches and ways but i don't like the way some people have of separating themselves from what may be unpopular in their relations i know i spoke rather shortly to miss caroline when she asked me whether i could bear the change from the great metropolis to a little country village in the first place why could not she call it london or town and have done with it and in the next place 
why should she not love the place that was her home well enough to fancy that every one would like it when they came to know it as well as she did i was conscious i was rather abrupt in my conversation with her and i saw that mr morgan was watching me though he pretended to be listening to miss tomkinson's whispered account of her sister's symptoms but when we were once more in the street he began my dear young friend i winced for all the morning i had noticed that when he was going to give me a little unpalatable advice he always began with my dear young friend he had done so about the horse my dear young friend there are one or two hints i should like to give you about your manner the great sir everard home used to say a general practitioner should either have a very good manner or a very bad one now in the latter case he must be possessed of talents and acquirements sufficient to ensure his being sought after whatever his manner might be but the rudeness will give notoriety to these qualifications abernathy is a case in point i rather myself question the taste of bad manners i therefore have studied to acquire an attentive anxious politeness which combines ease and grace with a tender regard and interest i am not aware whether i have succeeded few men do in coming up to my ideal but i recommend you to strive after this manner peculiarly befitting our profession identify yourself with your patients my dear sir you have sympathy in your good heart i am sure to really feel pain when listening to their account of their sufferings and it soothes them to see the expression of this feeling in your manner it is in fact sir manners that make the man in our profession i don't set myself up as an example far from it but this is mr hutton's our vicar one of the servants is indisposed and i shall be glad of the opportunity of introducing you we can resume our conversation at another time i had not been aware that we had been holding a conversation in which i believe the assistance of two persons is required why had not mr hutton sent to ask after my health the evening before according to the custom of the place i felt rather offended chapter three the vicarage was on the north side of the street at the end opening towards the hills it was a long low house receding behind its neighbours a court was between the door and the street with a flag walk and an old stone cistern on the right hand side of the door solomon's seal growing under the windows someone was watching from behind the window curtain for the door opened as if by magic as soon as we reached it and we entered a low room which served as hall and was matted all over with deep old-fashioned window seats and dutch tiles in the fireplace altogether it was very cool and refreshing after the hot sun in the white and red street bessie is not so well mr morgan said the sweet little girl of eleven or so who had opened the door sophie wanted to send for you but papa said he was sure you would come soon this morning and we were to remember that there were other sick people wanting you here's mr morgan sophie said she opening the door into an inner room to which we descended a step as i remember well for i was nearly falling down it i was so caught by the picture within it was like a picture at least seen through the door frame a sort of mixture of crimson and sea green in the room and a sunny garden beyond a very low casement window open to the amber air clusters of white roses peeping in and sophie sitting on a cushion on the ground the light coming from above on her head and a little sturdy round-eyed brother kneeling by her to whom she was teaching the alphabet 
it was a mighty relief to him when we came in as i could see and i am much mistaken if he was easily caught again to say his lesson when he was once sent off to find papa sophie rose quietly and of course we were just introduced and that was all before she took mr morgan upstairs to see her sick servant i was left to myself in the room it looked so like a home that it at once made me know the full charm of the word there were books and work about and tokens of employment there was a child's plaything on the floor and against the sea-green walls there hung a likeness or two done in water-colours one i was sure was that of sophie's mother the chairs and sofa were covered with a chintz the same as the curtains a little pretty red rose on a white ground i don't know where the crimson came from but i am sure there was crimson somewhere perhaps in the carpet there was a glass door besides the window and you went up a step into the garden this was first a grass plot just under the windows and beyond that straight gravel walks with box borders and narrow flower beds on each side most brilliant and gay at the end of august as it was then and behind the flower borders were fruit trees trained over woodwork so as to shut out the beds of kitchen garden within while i was looking round a gentleman came in who i was sure was the vicar it was rather awkward for i had to account for my presence there i came with mr morgan my name is harrison said i bowing i could see he was not much enlightened by this explanation but we sat down and talked about the time of year or some such matter till sophie and mr morgan came back then i saw mr morgan to advantage with a man whom he respected as he did the vicar he lost the prim artificial manner he had in general and was calm and dignified but not so dignified as the vicar i never saw any one like him he was very quiet and reserved almost absent at times his personal appearance was not striking but he was altogether a man you would talk to with your hat off whenever you met him it was his character that produced this effect character that he never thought about but that appeared in every word and look and motion sophie said he mr morgan looks very warm could you not gather a few jargonelle pears off the south wall i fancy there are some ripe there our jargonelle pears are remarkably early this year sophie went into the sunny garden and i saw her take a rake and tilt at the pears which were above her reach apparently the parlour had become chilly i found out afterwards it had a flag floor which accounts for its coldness and i thought i should like to go into the warm sun i said i would go and help the young lady and without waiting for an answer i went into the warm scented garden where the bees were rifling the flowers and making a continual busy sound i think sophie had begun to despair of getting the fruit and was glad of my assistance i thought i was very senseless to have knocked them down so soon when i found we were to go in as soon as they were gathered i should have liked to have walked round the garden but sophie walked straight off with the pears and i could do nothing but follow her she took up her needlework while we ate them they were very soon finished and when the vicar had ended his conversation with mr morgan about some poor people we rose up to come away i was thankful that mr morgan had said so little about me i could not have endured that he should have introduced sir astley cooper or sir robert peel at the vicarage nor yet could i have brooked much mention of my great opportunities for acquiring a thorough knowledge of my profession which i had heard him describe to miss tomkinson while her sister was talking to me luckily however 
he spared me all this at the vicar's when we left it was time to mount our horses and go to the country rounds and i was glad of it chapter four by and by the inhabitants of duncombe began to have parties in my honour mr morgan told me it was on my account or i don't think i should have found it out but he was pleased at every fresh invitation and rubbed his hands and chuckled as if it was a compliment to himself as in truth it was meanwhile the arrangement with mrs rose had been brought to a conclusion she was to bring her furniture and place it in a house of which i was to pay the rent she was to be the mistress and in return she was not to pay anything for her board mr morgan took the house and delighted in advising and settling all my affairs i was partly indolent and partly amused and was altogether passive the house he took for me was near his own it had two sitting-rooms downstairs opening into each other by folding doors which were however kept shut in general the back room was my consulting-room the library he advised me to call it and gave me a skull to put on the top of my bookcase in which the medical books were all ranged on the conspicuous shelves while miss austen dickens and thackeray were by mr morgan himself skilfully placed in a careless way upside down or with their backs turned to the wall the front parlour was to be the dining-room and the room above was furnished with mrs rose's drawing-room chairs and table though i found she preferred sitting downstairs in the dining-room close to the window where between every stitch she could look up and see what was going on in the street i felt rather queer to be the master of this house filled with another person's furniture before i had even seen the lady whose property it was presently she arrived mr morgan met her at the inn where the coach stopped and accompanied her to my house i could see them out of the drawing-room window the little gentleman stepping daintily along flourishing his cane and evidently talking away she was a little taller than he was and in deep widow's mourning such veils and falls and capes and cloaks that she looked like a black crape haycock when we were introduced she put up her thick veil and looked round and sighed your appearance and circumstances mr harrison remind me forcibly of the time when i was married to my dear husband now at rest he was then like you commencing practice as a surgeon for twenty years i sympathized with him and assisted him by every means in my power even to making up pills when the young man was out may we live together in harmony for an equal length of time may the regard between us be equally sincere although instead of being conjugal it is to be maternal and filial i am sure she had been concocting the speech in the coach for she afterwards told me she was the only passenger when she had ended i felt as if i ought to have had a glass of wine in my hand to drink after the manner of toasts and yet i doubt i should have done it heartily for i did not hope to live with her for twenty years it had rather a dreary sound however i only bowed and kept my thoughts to myself i asked mr morgan while mrs rose was upstairs taking off her things to stay to tea to which he agreed and kept rubbing his hands with satisfaction saying a very fine woman sir very fine woman and what a manner how she will receive patients who may wish to leave a message during your absence such a flow of words to be sure mr morgan could not stay long after tea as there were one or two cases to be seen i would willingly have gone and had my hat on indeed for the purpose when he said it would not be respectful not the thing to leave mrs rose the first evening of her arrival 
tender deference to the sex to a widow in the first months of her loneliness requires this little consideration my dear sir i will leave that case at miss tomkinson's for you you will perhaps call early to-morrow morning miss tomkinson is rather particular and is apt to speak plainly if she does not think herself properly attended to i had often noticed that he shuffled off the visits to miss tomkinson's on me and i suspect he was a little afraid of the lady it was rather a long evening with mrs rose she had nothing to do thinking it civil i suppose to stop in the parlour and not go upstairs and unpack i begged i might be no restraint upon her if she wished to do so but rather to my disappointment she smiled in a measured subdued way and said it would be a pleasure to her to become better acquainted with me she went upstairs once and my heart misgave me when i saw her come down with a clean folded pocket handkerchief oh my prophetic soul she was no sooner seated than she began to give me an account of her late husband's illness and symptoms and death it was a very common case but she evidently seemed to think it had been peculiar she had just a smattering of medical knowledge and used the technical terms so very mal a propos that i could hardly keep from smiling but i would not have done it for the world she was evidently in such deep and sincere distress at last she said i have the diagnosis of my dear husband's complaint in my desk mr harrison if you would like to draw up the case for the lancet i think he would have felt gratified poor fellow if he had been told such a compliment would be paid to his remains and that his case would appear in those distinguished columns it was rather awkward for the case was of the very commonest as i said before however i had not been even this short time in practice without having learnt a few of those noises which do not compromise one and yet may bear a very significant construction if the listener chooses to exert a little imagination before the end of the evening we were such friends that she brought me down the late mr rose's picture to look at she told me she could not bear herself to gaze upon the beloved features but that if i would look upon the miniature she would avert her face i offered to take it into my own hands but she seemed wounded at the proposal and said she never never could trust such a treasure out of her own possession so she turned her head very much over her left shoulder while i examined the likeness held by her extended right arm the late mr rose must have been rather a good-looking jolly man and the artist had given him such a broad smile and such a twinkle about the eyes that it really was hard to help smiling back at him however i restrained myself at first mrs rose objected to accepting any of the invitations which were sent her to accompany me to the tea parties in the town she was so good and simple that i was sure she had no other reason than the one which she alleged the short time that had elapsed since her husband's death or else now that i had had some experience of the entertainments which she declined so pertinaciously i might have suspected that she was glad of the excuse i used sometimes to wish that i was a widow i came home tired from a day's hard riding and if i had but felt sure that mr morgan would not come in i should certainly have put on my slippers and my loose morning coat and have indulged in a cigar in the garden it seemed a cruel sacrifice to society to dress myself in tight boots and a stiff coat and go to a five o'clock tea but mr morgan read me such lectures upon the necessity of cultivating the goodwill of the people among whom i was settled and seemed so sorry and almost hurt when i once complained of the dullness of these parties that i felt i could not be so selfish as to decline more than one out of three mr morgan if he found that i had an invitation for the evening 
would often take the longer round and the more distant visits i suspected him at first of the design which i confess i often entertained of shirking the parties but i soon found out he was really making a sacrifice of his inclinations for what he considered to be my advantage chapter five there was one invitation which seemed to promise a good deal of pleasure mr bullock who is the attorney of duncombe was married a second time to a lady from a large provincial town she wished to lead the fashion a thing very easy to do for every one was willing to follow her so instead of giving a tea-party in my honour she proposed a picnic to some old hall in the neighbourhood and really the arrangement sounded tempting enough every patient we had seemed full of the subject both those who were invited and those who were not there was a moat around the house with a boat on it and there was a gallery in the hall from which music sounded delightfully the family to whom the place belonged were abroad and lived at a newer and grander mansion when they were at home there were only a farmer and his wife in the old hall and they were to have the charge of the preparations the little kind-hearted town was delighted when the sun shone bright on the october morning of our picnic the shopkeepers and cottagers all looked pleased as they saw the cavalcade gathering at mr bullock's door we were somewhere about twenty in number a silent few she called us but i thought we were quite enough there were the miss tomkinsons and two of their young ladies one of them belonged to a country family mrs bullock told me in a whisper then came mr mrs and miss bullock and a tribe of little children the offspring of the present wife miss bullock was only a stepdaughter mrs munton had accepted the invitation to join our party which was rather unexpected by the host and hostess i imagine from the little remarks that i overheard but they made her very welcome miss horseman a maiden lady who had been on a visit from home till last week was another and last there were the vicar and his children these with mr morgan and myself made up the party i was very much pleased to see something more of the vicar's family he had come in occasionally to the evening parties it is true and spoke kindly to us all but it was not his habit to stay very long at them and his daughter was he said too young to visit she had had the charge of her little sisters and brother since her mother's death which took up a good deal of her time and she was glad of the evenings to pursue her own studies but to-day the case was different and sophie and helen and lizzie and even little walter were all there standing at mrs bullock's door for we none of us could be patient enough to sit still in the parlour with mrs munton and the elder ones quietly waiting for two chaises and the spring-cart which was to have been there by two o'clock but now it was nearly a quarter past shameful the brightness of the day would be gone the sympathetic shopkeepers standing at their respective doors with their hands in their pockets had one and all their heads turned in the direction from which the carriages as mrs bullock called them were to come there was a rumble along the paved street and the shopkeepers turned and smiled and bowed their heads congratulatingly to us all the mothers and all the little children of the place stood clustering round the doors to see us set off i had my horse waiting and meanwhile i assisted people into their vehicles one sees a good deal of management on such occasions mrs munton was handed first into one of the chaises then there was a little hanging back for most of the young people wished to go in the cart i don't know why miss horseman however came forward and as she was known to be the intimate friend of mrs munton so far was satisfactory but who was to be third bodkin with two old ladies 
who liked the windows shut. I saw Sophie speaking to Helen, and then she came forward and offered to be the third. The two old ladies looked pleased and glad, as every one did near Sophie, so that the chaiseful was arranged. Just as it was going off, however, the servant from the vicarage came running with a note for her master. When he had read it, he went to the chaise door, and I suppose told Sophie what I afterwards heard him say to Mrs. Bullock, that the clergyman of a neighbouring parish was ill and unable to read the funeral service for one of his parishioners, who was to be buried that afternoon. The vicar was, of course, obliged to go, and said he should not return home that night. It seemed a relief to some, I perceived, to be without the little restraint of his dignified presence. Mr. Morgan came up just at the moment, having ridden hard all the morning to be in time to join our party. So we were resigned on the whole to the vicar's absence. His own family regretted him the most, I noticed, and I liked them all the better for it. I believe that I came next in being sorry for his departure, but I respected and admired him, and felt always the better for having been in his company. Miss Tomkinson, Mrs. Bullock, and the country young lady were in the next chaise. I think the last would rather have been in the cart with the younger and merrier set, but I imagine that was considered infradig. The remainder of the party were to ride and tie, and a most riotous laughing set they were. Mr. Morgan and I were on horseback. At least I led my horse, with little Walter riding on him, his fat sturdy legs standing stiff out on each side of my cob's broad back. He was a little darling, and chattered all the way, his sister Sophie being the heroine of all his stories. I found he owed his day's excursion entirely to her begging papa to let him come. Nurse was strongly against it cross old nurse he called her once and then said no not cross kind nurse sophie tells walter not to say cross nurse i never saw so young a child so brave the horse shied at a log of wood walter looked very red and grasped the mane but sat upright like a little man and never spoke all the time the horse was dancing when it was over, he looked at me and smiled. You would not let me be hurt, Mr. Harrison, would you? He was the most winning little fellow I ever saw. There were frequent cries to me from the cart. Oh, Mr. Harrison, do get us that branch of blackberries. You can reach it with your whip handle. Oh, Mr. Harrison, there were such splendid nuts on the other side of that hedge. Would you just turn back for them? Miss Caroline Tomkinson was once or twice rather faint with the motion of the cart, and asked me for my smelling-bottle, as she had forgotten hers. I was amused at the idea of my carrying such articles about with me. Then she thought she should like to walk, and got out, and came on my side of the road, but I found little Walter the pleasanter companion, and soon set the horse off into a trot, with which pace her tender constitution could not keep up. The road to the old hall was along a sandy lane, with high hedge-banks, the which elms almost met overhead. Shocking farming, Mr. Bullock called out, and so it might be, but it was very pleasant and picturesque looking. The trees were gorgeous in their orange and crimson hues, varied by great dark green holly bushes glistening in the autumn sun i should have thought the colours too vivid if i had seen them in a picture especially when we wound up the brow after crossing the little bridge over the brook what laughing and screaming there was as the cart splashed through the sparkling water and i caught the purple hills beyond we could see the old hall, too, from that point, with its warm rich woods billowing up behind, and the blue waters of the moat lying still under the sunlight. Laughing and talking is very hungry work, 
and there was a universal petition for dinner when we arrived at the lawn before the hall, where it had been arranged that we were to dine. I saw Miss Carey take Miss Tomkinson aside and whisper to her, and presently the elder sister came up to me where I was busy, rather apart, making a seat of hay which I had fetched from the farmer's loft for my little friend Walter, who, I had noticed, was rather hoarse and for whom I was afraid of a seat on the grass, dry as it appeared to be. Mr. Harrison, Caroline tells me she has been feeling very faint, and she is afraid of a return of one of her attacks. She says she has more confidence in your medical powers than in Mr. Morgan's. I should not be sincere if I did not say that I differ from her, but as it is so, may I beg you to keep an eye upon her? I tell her she had better not have come if she did not feel well. But, poor girl, she has set her heart upon this day's pleasure. I have offered to go home with her, but, she says, if she can only feel sure you are at hand, she would rather stay. Of course I bowed and promised all due attendance on Miss Caroline and in the meantime, until she did require my services, I thought I might as well go and help the vicar's daughter, who looked so fresh and pretty in her white muslin dress, here, there, and everywhere, now in the sunshine, now in the green shade, helping everyone to be comfortable and thinking of everyone but herself. Presently Mr. Morgan came up. Miss Caroline does not feel quite well, I have promised your services to her sister. So have I, sir. But Miss Sophie cannot carry this heavy basket. I did not mean her to have heard this excuse, but she caught it up and said, Oh, yes, I can. I can take the things out one by one. Go to poor Miss Caroline, pray, Mr. Harrison. I went, but very unwillingly, I must say. When I had once seated myself by her, I think she must have felt better. It was, probably, only a nervous fear, which was relieved when she knew she had assistance near at hand, for she made a capital dinner. I thought she would never end her modest requests for just a little more pigeon pie, or a merry thought of chicken. Such a hearty meal would, I hoped, effectually revive her, and so it did for she told me she thought she could manage to walk round the garden and see the old peacock ewes if I would kindly give her my arm. It was very provoking. I had so set my heart upon being with the vicar's children. I advised Miss Caroline strongly to lie down a little and rest before tea on the sofa in the farmer's kitchen. You cannot think how persuasively I begged her to take care of herself. At last she consented, thanking me for my tender interest. She should never forget my kind attention to her. She little knew what was in my mind at the time. However, she was safely consigned to the farmer's wife, and I was rushing out in search of a white gown and a waving figure, when I encountered Mrs. Bullock at the door of the hall. She was a fine, fierce-looking woman. I thought she had appeared a little displeased at my unwilling attentions on Miss Caroline at dinner-time, but now, seeing me alone, she was all smiles. Oh, Mr. Harrison, all alone, how is that? What are the young ladies about to allow such churlishness? And, by the way, I have left a young lady who will be very glad of your assistance, I am sure. My daughter, Jemima, her stepdaughter, she meant. Mr. Bullock is so particular and so tender a father that he would be frightened to death at the idea of her going into the boat on the moat unless she was with someone who could swim. He is gone to discuss the new wheel plough with the farmer. You know agriculture is his hobby, although law, horrid law, is his business. But the poor girl is pining on the bank, longing for my permission to join the others, which I dare not give, unless you will kindly accompany her, and promise, if any accident happens, to preserve her safe. O oh, Sophie, 
why was no one anxious about you chapter six miss bullock was standing by the waterside looking wistfully as i thought at the water party the sound of whose merry laughter came pleasantly enough from the boat which lay off for indeed no one knew how to row and she was of a clumsy flat-bottomed build about a hundred yards weather-bound as they shouted out among the long stalks of the water-lilies miss bullock did not look up till i came close to her and then when i told her my errand she lifted up her great heavy sad eyes and looked at me for a moment it struck me at the time that she expected to find some expression on my face which was not there and that its absence was a relief to her she was a very pale unhappy looking girl but very quiet and if not agreeable in manner at any rate not forward or offensive i called to the party in the boat and they came slowly enough through the large cool green lily leaves towards us when they got near we saw there was no room for us and miss bullock said she would rather stay in the meadow and saunter about if i would go into the boat and i am certain from the look on her countenance that she spoke the truth but miss horseman called out in a sharp voice while she smiled in a very disagreeable knowing way oh mamma will be displeased if you don't come in miss bullock after all her trouble in making such a nice arrangement at this speech the poor girl hesitated and at last in an undecided way as if she was not sure whether she was doing right she took sophie's place in the boat helen and lizzie landed with their sister so that there was plenty of room for miss tomkins and miss horseman and all the little bullocks and the three vicarage girls went off strolling along the meadow side and playing with walter who was in a high state of excitement the sun was getting low but the declining light was beautiful upon the water and to add to the charm of the time sophie and her sisters standing on the green lawn in front of the hall struck up the little german cannon which i had never heard before o vivo ist mir am abend etc at last we were summoned to tug the boat to the landing steps on the lawn tea and a blazing wood fire being ready for us in the hall i was offering my arm to miss horseman as she was a little lame when she said again in her peculiar disagreeable way had you not better take miss bullock mr harrison it will be more satisfactory i helped miss horseman up the steps however and then she repeated her advice so remembering that miss bullock was in fact the daughter of my entertainers i went to her but though she accepted my arm I could perceive she was sorry that I had offered it. The hall was lighted by the glorious wood fire in the wide old grate. The daylight was dying away in the west, and the large windows admitted but little of what was left through their small leaded frames, with coats of arms emblazoned upon them. The farmer's wife had set out a great long table which was piled with good things and a huge black kettle sang on the glowing fire which sent a cheerful warmth through the room as it crackled and blazed mr morgan who i found had been taking a little round in the neighbourhood among his patients was there smiling and rubbing his hands as usual mr bullock was holding a conversation with the farmer at the garden door on the nature of different manures in which it struck me that if mr bullock had the fine names and theories on his side the farmer had all the practical knowledge and the experience and i know which i would have trusted i think mr bullock rather liked to talk about liebig in my hearing it sounded well and was knowing mrs bullock was not particularly placid in her mood in the first place i wanted to sit by the vicar's daughter and miss caroline as decidedly wanted to sit on my other side being afraid of her fainting fits i imagine 
but mrs bullock called me to a place near her daughter now i thought i had done enough civility to a girl who was evidently annoyed rather than pleased by my attentions and i pretended to be busy stooping under the table for miss caroline's gloves which were missing but it was of no avail mrs bullock's fine severe eyes were awaiting my reappearance and she summoned me again i am keeping this place on my right hand for you mr harrison jemima sit still i went up to the post of honour and tried to busy myself with pouring out coffee to hide my chagrin but after forgetting to empty the water put in to warm the cups mrs bullock said and omitting to add any sugar the lady told me she would dispense with my services and turn me over to my neighbour on the other side talking to the younger lady was no doubt more mr harrison's vocation than assisting the elder one i dare say it was only the manner that made the word seem offensive miss horseman sat opposite me smiling away miss bullock did not speak but seemed more depressed than ever at length miss horseman and mrs bullock got to a war of innuendos which were completely unintelligible to me and i was very much displeased with my situation while at the bottom of the table mr morgan and mr bullock were making the young ones laugh most heartily part of the joke was mr morgan's insisting upon making tea at that end and sophie and helen were busy contriving every possible mistake for him i thought honour was a very good thing but merriment a better here was i in the place of distinction hearing nothing but cross words at last the time came for us to go home as the evening was damp the seats in the chaises were the best and most to be desired and now sophie offered to go in the cart only she seemed anxious and so was i that walter should be secured from the effects of the white wreaths of fog rolling up from the valley but the little violent affectionate fellow would not be separated from sophie she made a nest for him on her knee in one corner of the cart and covered him with her own shawl i hoped that he would take no harm miss tomkinson mr bullock and some of the young ones walked but i seemed chained to the windows of the chaise for miss caroline begged me not to leave her as she was dreadfully afraid of robbers and mrs bullock implored me to see that the man did not overturn them in the bad roads as he had certainly had too much to drink i became so irritable before i reached home that i thought it was the most disagreeable day of pleasures i had ever had and could hardly bear to answer mrs rose's never-ending questions she told me however that from my account the day was so charming that she thought she should relax in the rigour of her seclusion and mingle a little more in the society of which i gave so tempting a description she really thought her dear mr rose would have wished it and his will should be law to her after his death as it had ever been during his life in compliance therefore with his wishes she would even do a little violence to her own feelings she was very good and kind not merely attentive to everything which she thought could conduce to my comfort but willing to take any trouble in providing the broths and nourishing food which i often found it convenient to order under the name of kitchen physic for my poorer patients and i really did not see the use of her shutting herself up in mere compliance with an etiquette when she began to wish to mix in the little quiet society of duncombe accordingly i urged her to begin to visit and even when applied to as to what i imagined the late mr rose's wishes on that subject would have been answered for that worthy gentleman and assured his widow that i was convinced he would have regretted deeply her giving way to immoderate grief and would have been rather grateful than otherwise at seeing her endeavour to divert her thoughts by a few quiet visits she cheered up and said as i really thought so 
she would sacrifice her own inclinations and accept the very next invitation that came chapter seven i was roused from my sleep in the middle of the night by a messenger from the vicarage little walter had got the croup and mr morgan had been sent for into the country i dressed myself hastily and went through the quiet little street there was a light burning upstairs at the vicarage it was in the nursery the servant who opened the door the instant i knocked was crying sadly and could hardly answer my inquiries as i went up the stairs two steps at a time to see my little favourite the nursery was a great large room at the farther end it was lighted by a common candle which left the other end where the door was in shade so i suppose the nurse did not see me come in for she was speaking very crossly miss sophie said she i told you over and over again it was not fit for him to go with the hoarseness that he had and you would take him it will break your papa's heart i know but it's none of my doing whatever sophie felt she did not speak in answer to this she was on her knees by the warm bath in which the little fellow was struggling to get his breath with a look of terror on his face that i have often noticed in young children when smitten by a sudden and violent illness it seems as if they recognize something infinite and invisible at whose bidding the pain and the anguish come from which no love can shield them it is a very heart-rending look to observe because it comes on the faces of those who are too young to receive comfort from the words of faith or the promises of religion walter had his arms tightly round sophie's neck as if she hitherto his paradise angel could save him from the dread shadow of death yes of death i knelt down by him on the other side and examined him the very robustness of his little frame gave violence to the disease which is always one of the most fearful by which children of his age can be attacked don't tremble watty said sophie in a soothing tone it's mr harrison darling who let you ride on his horse i could detect the quivering in the voice which she tried to make so calm and soft to quiet the little fellow's fears we took him out of the bath and i went for leeches while i was away mr morgan came he loved the vicarage children as if he were their uncle but he stood still and aghast at the sight of walter so lately bright and strong and now hurrying alone to the awful change to the silent mysterious land where tended and cared for as he had been on earth he must go alone the little fellow the darling we applied the leeches to his throat he resisted at first but sophie god bless her put the agony of her grief on one side and thought only of him and began to sing the little songs he loved we were all still the gardener had gone to fetch the vicar but he was twelve miles off and we doubted if he would come in time i don't know if they had any hope but the first moment mr morgan's eyes met mine i saw that he like me had none the ticking of the house clock sounded through the dark quiet house walter was sleeping now with the black leeches yet hanging to his fair white throat still sophie went on singing little lullabies which she had sung under far different and happier circumstances i remember one verse because it struck me at the time as strangely applicable sleep baby sleep thy rest shall angels keep while on the grass the lamb shall feed and never suffer want or need sleep baby sleep the tears were in mr morgan's eyes i do not think either he or i could have spoken in our natural tones 
but the brave girl went on clear though low she stopped at last and looked up he is better is he not mr morgan no my dear he is <clears throat> he could not speak all at once then he said my dear he will be better soon think of your mamma my dear miss sophie she will be very thankful to have one of her darlings safe with her where she is still she did not cry but she bent her head down on the little face and kissed it long and tenderly i will go for helen and lizzie they will be sorry not to see him again she rose up and went for them poor girls they came in their dressing gowns with eyes dilated with sudden emotion pale with terror stealing softly along as if sound could disturb him sophie comforted them by gentle caresses it was over soon mr morgan was fairly crying like a child but he thought it necessary to apologize to me for what i honored him for i am a little overdone by yesterday's work sir i have had one or two bad nights and they rather upset me when i was your age i was as strong and manly as any one and would have scorned to shed tears sophie came up to where we stood mr morgan i am so sorry for papa how shall i tell him she was struggling against her own grief for her father's sake mr morgan offered to await his coming home and she seemed thankful for the proposal i new friend almost stranger might stay no longer the street was as quiet as ever not a shadow was changed for it was not yet four o'clock but during the night a soul had departed from all i could see and all i could learn the vicar and his daughter strove which should comfort the other the most each thought of the other's grief each prayed for the other rather than for themselves we saw them walking out countrywards and we heard of them in the cottages of the poor but it was some time before i happened to meet either of them again and then i felt from something indescribable in their manner towards me that i was one of the peculiar people whom death had made dear that one day at the old hall had done this i was perhaps the last person who had given the little fellow any unusual pleasure poor walter i wish i could have done more to make his short life happy chapter eight there was a little lull out of respect to the vicar's grief in the visiting it gave time to mrs rose to soften down the anguish of her weeds at christmas miss tomkinson sent out invitations for a party miss caroline had once or twice apologized to me because such an event had not taken place before but as she said the avocations of their daily life prevented their having such little reunions except in the vacations and sure enough as soon as the holidays began came the civil little note the miss tomkinsons request the pleasure of mrs rose's and mr harrison's company at tea on the evening of monday the twenty third inst tea at five o'clock mrs rose's spirits roused like a war-horse at the sound of the trumpet at this she was not of a repining disposition but i do think she believed the party-giving population of duncombe had given up inviting her as soon as she had determined to relent and accept the invitations in compliance with the late mr rose's wishes such snippings of white love ribbon as i found everywhere making the carpet untidy one day too unluckily a small box was brought to me by mistake i did not look at the direction for i never doubted it was some hyoscyamus which i was expecting from london so i tore it open 
and saw inside a piece of paper with no more grey hair in large letters upon it i folded it up in a hurry and sealed it afresh and gave it to mrs rose but i could not refrain from asking her soon after if she could recommend me anything to keep my hair from turning grey adding that i thought prevention was better than cure i think she made out the impression of my seal on the paper after that for i learned that she had been crying and that she talked about there being no sympathy left in the world for her since mr rose's death and that she counted the days until she could rejoin him in the better world i think she counted the days to miss tomkinson's party too she talked so much about it the covers were taken off miss tomkinson's chairs and curtains and sofas and a great jar full of artificial flowers was placed in the centre of the table which as miss caroline told me was all her doing as she doted on the beautiful and artistic in life miss tomkinson stood erect as a grenadier close to the door receiving her friends and heartily shaking them by the hands as they entered she said she was truly glad to see them and so she really was we had just finished tea and miss caroline had brought out a little pack of conversation cards sheaves of slips of cardboard with intellectual or sentimental questions on one set and equally intellectual and sentimental answers on the other and as the answers were fit to any and all the questions you may think they were a characterless and worish set of things i had just been asked by miss caroline can you tell what those dearest to you think of you at this present time and had answered how can you expect me to reveal such a secret to the present company when the servant announced that a gentleman a friend of mine wished to speak to me downstairs oh show him up martha show him up said miss tomkinson in her hospitality any friend of our friends is welcome said miss caroline in an insinuating tone i jumped up however thinking it might be some one on business but i was so penned in by the spider-legged tables stuck out on every side that i could not make the haste i wished and before i could prevent it martha had shown up jack marshland who was on his road home for a day or two at christmas he came up in a hearty way bowing to miss tomkinson and explaining that he had found himself in my neighbourhood and had come over to pass a night with me and that my servant had directed him where i was his voice loud at all times sounded like stentors in that little room where we all spoke in a kind of purring way he had no swell in his tones they were forte from the beginning at first it seemed like the days of my youth come back again to hear full manly speaking i felt proud of my friend as he thanked miss tomkinson for her kindness in asking him to stay the evening by and by he came up to me and i dare say he thought he had lowered his voice for he looked as if speaking confidentially while in fact the whole room might have heard him frank my boy when shall we have dinner at this good old lady's i'm deuced hungry dinner why we had had tea an hour ago while he yet spoke martha came in with a little tray on which was a single cup of coffee and three slices of wafer bread and butter his dismay and his evident submission to the decrees of fate tickled me so much that i thought he should have a further taste of the life i led from month's end to month's end and i gave up my plan of taking him home at once and enjoyed the anticipation of the hearty laugh we should have together at the end of the evening i was famously punished for my determination shall we continue our game asked miss caroline who had never relinquished her sheaf of questions we went on questioning and answering with little gain of information to either party no such thing as heavy betting in this game eh frank asked jack who had been watching us 
you don't lose ten pounds at a sitting i guess as you used to do at shorts playing for love i suppose you call it miss caroline simpered and looked down jack was not thinking of her he was thinking of the days we had had at the mermaid suddenly he said where were you this day last year frank i don't remember said i then i'll tell you it's the twenty-third the day you were taken up for knocking down the fellow in long acre and that i had to bail you out ready for christmas day you are in more agreeable quarters to-night he did not intend his reminiscence to be heard but was not in the least put out when miss tomkinson with a face of dire surprise asked mr harrison taken up sir oh yes ma'am and you see it was so common an affair with him to be locked up that he can't remember the dates of his different imprisonments he laughed heartily and so should i but that i saw the impression it made the thing was in fact simple enough and capable of easy explanation i had been made angry by seeing a great hulking fellow out of mere wantonness break the crutch from under a cripple and i struck the man more violently than i intended and down he went yelling out for the police and i had to go before the magistrate to be released i disdained giving this explanation at the time it was no business of theirs what i had been doing a year ago but still jack might have held his tongue however that unruly member of his was set a-going and he told me afterwards he was resolved to let the old ladies into a little of life and accordingly he remembered every practical joke we had ever had and talked and laughed and roared again i tried to converse with miss caroline mrs munton any one but jack was the hero of the evening and every one was listening to him then he has never sent any hoaxing letters since he came here has he good boy he has turned over a new leaf he was the deepest dog that i ever met with such anonymous letters as he used to send do you remember that to mrs walbrook eh frank that was too bad the wretch was laughing all the time no i won't tell about it don't be afraid such a shameful hoax laughing again pray do tell i called out for he made it seem far worse than it was oh no no you've established a better character i would not for the world nip your budding efforts we'll bury the past in oblivion i tried to tell my neighbours the story to which he alluded but they were attracted by the merriment of jack's manner and did not care to hear the plain matter of fact then came a pause jack was talking almost quietly to miss horseman suddenly he called across the room how many times have you been out with the hounds the hedges were blind very late this year but you must have had some good mild days since i have never been out said i shortly never phew why i thought that was the great attraction to duncombe now was he not provoking he would condole with me and fix the subject in the minds of every one present the supper trays were brought in and there was a shuffling of situations he and i were close together again i say frank what will you lay me that i don't clear that tray before people are ready for their second helping i'm as hungry as a hound you shall have a round of beef and raw leg of mutton when we go home only do behave yourself here well for your sake but keep me away from those trays or i'll not answer for myself hold me or i'll fight as the irishman said i'll go and talk to that little old lady in blue and sit with my back to those ghosts of eatables he sat down by miss caroline who would not have liked his description of her and began an earnest tolerably quiet conversation i tried to be as agreeable as i could to do away with the impression he had given of me 
but I found that every one drew up a little stiffly at my approach, and did not encourage me to make many remarks. In the middle of my attempts I heard Miss Caroline beg Jack to take a glass of wine, and I saw him help himself to what appeared to be port, but in an instant he set it down from his lips, exclaiming, Vinegar by Jove! He made the most horribly wry face, and Miss Tomkinson came up in a severe hurry to investigate the affair. It turned out it was some black currant wine, on which she particularly piqued herself. I drank two glasses of it to ingratiate myself with her, and can testify to its sourness. I don't think she noticed my exertions, she was so much engrossed in listening to Jack's excuse for his mal a propos observation. He told her with the gravest face that he had been a teetotaler so long that he had but a confused recollection of the distinction between wine and vinegar, particularly eschewing the latter, because it had been twice fermented, and that he had imagined Miss Caroline had asked him to take toast and water, or he should never have touched the decanter. CHAPTER Nine. As we were walking home, Jack said, Lord, Frank, I've had such fun with the little lady in blue. I told her you wrote to me every Saturday, telling me the events of the week. She took all in. He stopped to laugh, for he bubbled and chuckled so that he could not laugh and walk. And I told her you were deeply in love. Another laugh. And that I could not get you to tell me the name of the lady but that she had light brown hair. In short, I drew from life, and gave her an exact description of herself, and that I was most anxious to see her, and implore her to be merciful to you, for that you were a most timid, faint-hearted fellow with women. He laughed till I thought he would have fallen down. I begged her if she could guess who it was from my description. I'll answer for it she did. I took care of that, for I said you described a mole on the left cheek in the most poetical way, saying Venus had pinched it out of envy at seeing any one more lovely. Oh, hold me up or I shall fall, laughing and hunger make me so weak. Well, I say I begged her if she knew who your fair one could be, to implore her to save you. I said I knew one of your lungs had gone after a former unfortunate love affair, and that I could not answer for the other if the lady here were cruel. She spoke of a respirator, but I told her that it might do very well for the odd lung, but would it minister to a heart diseased? I really did talk fine. I have found out the secret of eloquence. It's believing what you've got to say and I worked myself well up with fancying you married to the little lady in blue. I got to laughing at last, angry as I had been, his impudence was irresistible. Mrs. Rose had come home in the sedan and gone to bed, and he and I sat up over the round of beef and brandy and water till two o'clock in the morning. He told me I had got quite into the professional way of mousing about a room, and mewing and purring according as my patients were ill or well. He mimicked me, and made me laugh at myself. He left early the next morning. Mr. Morgan came at his usual hour. He and Marshland would never have agreed and I should have been uncomfortable to see two friends of mine disliking and despising each other. Mr. Morgan was ruffled, but with his deferential manner to women he smoothed himself down before Mrs. Rose, regretted that he had not been able to come to Miss Tomkinson's the evening before, and consequently had not seen her in the society she was so well calculated to adorn. But when we were by ourselves, he said, I was sent for to Mrs. Munton's this morning, the old spasms. May I ask what is the story she tells me about? About prison, in fact. I trust, sir, she has made some little mistake, 
and that you never were that it is an unfounded report he could not get it out that you were in newgate for three months i burst out laughing the story had grown like a mushroom indeed mr morgan looked grave i told him the truth still he looked grave i've no doubt sir that you acted rightly but it has an awkward sound i imagined from your hilarity just now that there was no foundation whatever for the story unfortunately there is i was only a night at the police station i would go there again for the same cause sir very fine spirit sir quite like don quixote but don't you see you might as well have been to the hulks at once no sir i don't take my word before long the story will have grown to that however we won't anticipate evil mens conscia recti you remember is the great thing the part i regret is that it may require some short time to overcome a little prejudice which the story may excite against you however we won't dwell on it mens conscia recti don't think about it sir it was clear he was thinking a good deal about it chapter ten two or three days before this time i had had an invitation from the bullocks to dine with them on christmas day mrs rose was going to spend the week with friends in the town where she formerly lived and i had been pleased at the notion of being received into a family and of being a little with mr bullock who struck me as a bluff good-hearted fellow but this tuesday before christmas day there came an invitation from the vicar to dine there there were to be only their own family and mr morgan only their own family it was getting to be all the world to me i was in a passion with myself for having been so ready to accept mr bullock's invitation coarse and ungentlemanly as he was with his wife airs of pretension and miss bullock's stupidity i turned it over in my mind no i could not have a bad headache which should prevent me going to the place i did not care for and yet leave me at liberty to go where i wished all i could do was to join the vicarage girls after church and walk by their side in a long country ramble they were quiet not sad exactly but it was evident that the thought of walter was in their minds on this day we went through a copse where there were a good number of evergreens planted as covers for game the snow was on the ground but the sky was clear and bright and the sun glittered on the smooth holly leaves lizzie asked me to gather her some of the very bright red berries and she was beginning a sentence with do you remember when ellen said hush and looked towards sophie who was walking a little apart and crying softly to herself there was evidently some connection between walter and the holly berries for lizzie threw them away at once when she saw sophie's tears soon we came to a stile which led to an open breezy common half covered with gorse i helped the little girls over it and set them to run down the slope but i took sophie's arm in mine and though i could not speak i think she knew how i was feeling for her i could hardly bear to bid her good-bye at the vicarage gate it seemed as if i ought to go in and spend the day with her chapter eleven i vented my ill-humour in being late for the bullock's dinner there were one or two clerks towards whom mr bullock was patronising and pressing mrs bullock was decked out in extraordinary finery miss bullock looked plainer than ever but she had on some old gown or other i think for i heard mrs bullock tell her she was always making a figure of herself i began to-day to suspect that the mother would not be sorry if i took a fancy to the stepdaughter. i was again placed near her at dinner 
and when the little ones came into dessert i was made to notice how fond of children she was and indeed when one of them nestled to her her face did brighten but the moment she caught this loud whispered remark the gloom came back again with something even of anger in her look and she was quite sullen and obstinate when urged to sing in the drawing-room mrs bullock turned to me some young ladies won't sing unless they are asked by gentlemen she spoke very crossly if you ask jemima she will probably sing to oblige me it is evident she will not i thought the singing when we got it would probably be a great bore however i did as i was bid and went with my request to the young lady who was sitting a little apart she looked up at me with eyes full of tears and said in a decided tone which if i had not seen her eyes i should have said was as cross as her mamma's no sir i will not she got up and left the room i expected to hear mrs bullock abuse her for her obstinacy instead of that she began to tell me of the money that had been spent on her education of what each separate accomplishment had cost she was timid she said but very musical wherever her future home might be there would be no want for music she went on praising her till i hated her if they thought i was going to marry that great lubberly girl they were mistaken mr bullock and the clerks came up he brought out liebig and called me to him i can understand a good deal of this agricultural chemistry said he and have put it in practice without much success hitherto i confess but these unconnected letters puzzle me a little i suppose they have some meaning or else i should say it was mere bookmaking to put them in i think they give the page a very ragged appearance said mrs bullock who had joined us i inherit a little of my late father's taste for books and must say i like to see a good type a broad margin and an elegant binding my father despised variety how he would have held up his hands aghast at the cheap literature of these times he did not require many books but he would have twenty editions of those that he had and he paid more for binding than he did for the books themselves but elegance was everything with him he would not have admitted your liebeg mr bullock neither the nature of the subject nor the common type nor the common way in which your book is got up would have suited him go and make tea my dear and leave mr harrison and me to talk over a few of these manures we settled to it i explained the meaning of the symbols and the doctrine of chemical equivalents at last he said doctor you are giving me too strong a dose of it at one time let's have a small quantity taken hodi that's professional as mr morgan would call it come in and call when you have leisure and give me a lesson in my alphabet of all you've been telling me i can only remember that c means carbon and o oxygen and i see one must know the meaning of all these confounded letters before one can do much good with liebig we dine at three said mrs bullock there will always be a knife and fork for mr harrison bullock don't confine your invitation to the evening why you see i've a nap always after dinner so i could not be learning chemistry then don't be so selfish mr b think of the pleasure jemima and i shall have in mr harrison's society i put a stop to the discussion by saying i would come in the evenings occasionally and give mr bullock a lesson but that my professional duties occupied me invariably until that time i liked mr bullock he was simple and shrewd and to be with a man was a relief after all the feminine society i went through every day chapter twelve the next morning i met miss horseman so you dined at mr bullock's yesterday mr harrison quite a family party i hear they are quite charmed with you and your knowledge of chemistry 
Mr. Bullock told me so in Hodgson's shop just now. Miss Bullock is a nice girl, eh, Mr. Harrison? She looked sharply at me. Of course, whatever I thought, I could do nothing but assent. A nice little fortune, too, three thousand pounds, consoles, from her own mother. What did I care? She might have three million for me. I had begun to think a good deal about money, though, but not in connection with her. I had been doing up our books ready to send out our Christmas bills, and had been wondering how far the vicar would consider three hundred a year, with a prospect of increase, would justify me in thinking of Sophie. Think of her I could not help, and the more I thought of how good and sweet and pretty she was, the more I felt that she ought to have far more than I could offer. Besides, my father was a shopkeeper, and I saw the vicar had a sort of respect for family. I determined to try and be very attentive to my profession. I was as civil as could be to every one, and wore the nap off the brim of my hat by taking it off so often. I had my eyes open to every glimpse of Sophie. I am overstocked with gloves now that I bought at that time, by way of making errands into the shops where I saw her black gown. I bought pounds upon pounds of arrowroot till I was tired of the eternal arrowroot pudding Mrs. Rose gave me. I asked her if she could not make bread of it, but she seemed to think that would be expensive, so I took to soap as a safe purchase. I believe soap improves by keeping. CHAPTER Thirteen. The more I knew of Mrs. Rose, the better I liked her. She was sweet and kind and motherly, and we never had any rubs. I hurt her once or twice, I think, by cutting her short in her long stories about Mr. Rose. But I found out that when she had plenty to do she did not think of him quite so much. So I expressed a wish for Coraza shirts, and in the puzzle of devising how they were to be cut out, she forgot Mr. Rose for some time. I was still more pleased by her way about some legacy her elder brother left her. I don't know the amount, but it was something handsome, and she might have set up housekeeping for herself, but instead she told Mr. Morgan, who repeated it to me, that she should continue with me, as she had quite an elder sister's interest in me. The country young lady, Miss Tyrrell, returned to Miss Tomkinson's after the holidays. She had an enlargement of the tonsils which required to be frequently touched with caustic, so I often called to see her. Miss Caroline always received me, and kept me talking in her washed-out style, after I had seen my patient. One day she told me she thought she had a weakness about the heart, and would be glad if I would bring my stethoscope the next time, which I accordingly did, and while I was on my knees listening to the pulsations, one of the young ladies came in. She said, Oh dear, I never, I beg your pardon, ma'am, and scuttled out. There was not much the matter with Miss Caroline's heart, a little feeble in action or so, a mere matter of weakness and general languor. When I went down, I saw two or three of the girls peeping out of the half-closed schoolroom door, but they shut it immediately, and I heard them laughing. The next time I called, Miss Tomkinson was sitting in state to receive me. Miss Tyrrell's throat does not seem to make much progress. Do you understand the case, Mr. Harrison, or should we have further advice? I think Mr. Morgan would probably know more about it. I assured her it was the simplest thing in the world, that it always implied a little torpor in the constitution, and that we preferred working through the system, which of course was a slow process, and that the medicine the young lady was taking, iodide of iron, was sure to be successful, although the progress would not be rapid. She bent her head, and said, it might be so, but she confessed she had more confidence in medicines which had some effect. 
she seemed to expect me to tell her something but i had nothing to say and accordingly i bade good-bye somehow miss tomkinson always managed to make me feel very small by a succession of snubbings and whenever i left her i had always to comfort myself under her contradictions by saying to myself her saying it is so does not make it so or i invented good retorts which i might have made to her brusque speeches if i had but thought of them at the right time but it was provoking that i had not had the presence of mind to recollect them just when they were wanted chapter fourteen on the whole things went on smoothly mr holden's legacy came in just about this time and i felt quite rich five hundred pounds would furnish the house i thought when mrs rose left and sophie came i was delighted to to imagine that sophie perceived the difference of my manner to her from what it was to any one else and that she was embarrassed and shy in consequence but not displeased with me for it all was so flourishing that i went about on wings instead of feet we were very busy without having anxious cares my legacy was paid into mr bullock's hands who united a little banking business to his profession of law in return for his advice about investments which i never meant to take having a more charming if less profitable mode in my head i went pretty frequently to teach him his agricultural chemistry i was so happy in sophie's blushes that i was universally benevolent and desirous of giving pleasure to every one i went at mrs bullock's general invitation to dinner there one day unexpectedly but there was such a fuss of ill-concealed preparation consequent upon my coming that i never went again her little boy came in with an audibly given message from the cook to ask if this was the gentleman as she was to send in the best dinner service and dessert for i looked deaf but determined never to go again miss bullock and i meanwhile became rather friendly we found out that we mutually disliked each other and were contented with the discovery if people are worth anything this sort of non-liking is a very good beginning of friendship every good quality is revealed naturally and slowly and is a pleasant surprise i found out that miss bullock was sensible and even sweet-tempered when not irritated by her stepmother's endeavours to show her off but she would sulk for hours after mrs bullock's offensive praise of her good points and i never saw such a black passion as she went into when she suddenly came into the room when mrs bullock was telling me of all the offers she had had my legacy made me feel up to extravagance i scoured the country for a glorious nosegay of camellias which i sent to sophie on valentine's day i durst not add a line but i wished the flowers could speak and tell her how i loved her i called on miss tyrrell that day miss caroline was more simpering and affected than ever and full of allusions to the day do you affix much sincerity of meaning to the little gallantries of this day mr harrison asked she in a languishing tone i thought of my camellias and how my heart had gone with them into sophie's keeping and i told her i thought one might often take advantage of such a time to hint at feelings one dared not fully express i remembered afterwards the forced display she made after miss tyrrell left the room of a valentine but i took no notice at the time my head was full of sophie it was on that very day that john brownker the gardener to all of us who had small gardens to keep in order fell down and injured his wrist severely 
I don't give you the details of the case because they would not interest you, being too technical. If you have any curiosity, you will find them in the Lancet of August in that year. We all liked John, and this accident was felt like a town's misfortune. The gardens, too, just wanted doing up. Both Mr. Morgan and I went directly to him. It was a very awkward case, and his wife and children were crying sadly. He himself was in great distress at being thrown out of work. He begged us to do something that would cure him speedily, as he could not afford to be laid up with six children depending on him for bread. We did not say much before him, but we both thought the arm would have to come off, and it was his right arm. We talked it over when we came out of the cottage. Mr. Morgan had no doubt of the necessity. I went back at dinner time to see the poor fellow. He was feverish and anxious. He had caught up some expression of Mr. Morgan's in the morning, and had guessed the measures we had in contemplation. He bade his wife leave the room, and spoke to me by myself. If you please, sir. I'd rather be done for at once than have my arm taken off and be a burden to my family. I'm not afraid of dying, but I could not stand being a cripple for life, eating bread and not able to earn it. The tears were in his eyes with earnestness. I had all along been more doubtful about the necessity of the amputation than Mr. Morgan. I knew the improved treatment in such cases. In his days there was much more of the rough and ready in surgical practice, so I gave the poor fellow some hope. In the afternoon I met Mr. Bullock. So you are to try your hand at an amputation tomorrow, I hear. Poor John Brownker. I used to tell him he was not careful enough about his ladders. Mr. Morgan is quite excited about it. He asked me to be present and see how well a man from Guy's could operate. He says he is sure you'll do it beautifully. Pah! No such sights for me, thank you. Ruddy Mr. Bullock went a shade or two paler at the thought. Curious how professionally a man views these things. Here's Mr. Morgan, who has been all along as proud of you as if you were his own son absolutely rubbing his hands at the idea of this crowning glory, this feather in your cap. He told me just now he knew he had always been too nervous to be a good operator, and had therefore preferred sending for White from Chesterton. But now anyone might have a serious accident who liked, for you would always be at hand. I told Mr. Bullock I really thought we might avoid the amputation but his mind was preoccupied with the idea of it, and he did not care to listen to me. The whole town was full of it. That is a charm in a little town. Everybody is so sympathetically full of the same events. Even Miss Horseman stopped me to ask after John Brownkner with interest, but she threw cold water upon my intention of saving the arm. As for the wife and family, we'll take care of them. Think what a fine opportunity you have of showing off, Mr. Harrison. That was just like her, always ready with her suggestions of ill-natured or interested motives. Mr. Morgan heard my proposal of a mode of treatment by which I thought it possible that the arm might be saved. I differ from you, Mr. Harrison, said he. I regret it, but I differ in toto from you. Your kind heart deceives you in this instance. There is no doubt that amputation must take place. Not later than tomorrow morning, I should say. I have made myself at liberty to attend upon you, sir. I shall be happy to officiate as your assistant. Time was when I should have been proud to be principal, but a little trembling in my arm incapacitates me. I urged my reasons upon him again but he was obstinate. He had, in fact, boasted so much of my acquirements as an operator that he was unwilling I should lose this opportunity of displaying my skill. 
he could not see that there would be greater skill evinced in saving the arm nor did i think of this at the time i grew angry at his old-fashioned narrow-mindedness as i thought it and i became dogged in my resolution to adhere to my own course we parted very coolly and i went straight off to john brownkner to tell him i believed that i could save the arm if he would refuse to have it amputated when i calmed myself a little before going in and speaking to him i could not help acknowledging that we should run some risk of locked jaw but on the whole and after giving most earnest conscientious thought to the case i was sure that my mode of treatment would be best he was a sensible man i told him the difference of opinion that existed between mr morgan and myself i said there might be some little risk attending the non-amputation but that i should guard against it and i trusted that i should be able to preserve his arm under god's blessing said he reverently i bowed my head i don't like to talk too frequently of the dependence which i always felt on that holy blessing as to the result of my efforts but i was glad to hear that speech of john's because it showed a calm and faithful heart and i had almost certain hopes of him from that time we agreed that he should tell mr morgan the reason of his objections to the amputation and his reliance on my opinion i determined to recur to every book i had relating to such cases and to convince mr morgan if i could of my wisdom unluckily i found out afterwards that he had met miss horseman in the time that intervened before i saw him again at his own house that evening and she had more than hinted that i shrunk from performing the operation for very good reasons no doubt she had heard that the medical students in london were a bad set and were not remarkable for regular attendance in the hospitals she might be mistaken but she thought it was perhaps quite as well poor john brownker had not his arm cut off by was there not such a thing as mortification coming on after a clumsy operation it was perhaps only a choice of deaths mr morgan had been stung at all this perhaps i did not speak quite respectfully enough i was a good deal excited we only got more and more angry with each other though he to do him justice was as civil as could be all the time thinking that thereby he concealed his vexation and disappointment he did not try to conceal his anxiety about poor john i went home weary and dispirited i made up and took the necessary applications to john and promising to return with the dawn of day i would fain have stayed but i did not wish him to be alarmed about himself i went home and resolved to sit up and study the treatment of similar cases mrs rose knocked at the door come in said i sharply she said she had seen i had something on my mind all day and she could not go to bed without asking if there was nothing she could do she was good and kind and i could not help telling her a little of the truth she listened pleasantly and i shook her warmly by the hand thinking that though she might not be very wise her good heart made her worth a dozen keen sharp hard people like miss horseman when i went at daybreak i saw john's wife for a few minutes outside the door she seemed to wish her husband had been in mr morgan's hands rather than mine but she gave me as good an account as i dared to hope for of the manner in which her husband had passed the night this was confirmed by my own examination when mr morgan and i visited him together later on in the day john said what we had agreed upon the day before and i told mr morgan openly that it was by my advice that amputation was declined he did not speak to me till we had left the house then he said now sir 
from this time i consider this case entirely in your hands only remember the poor fellow has a wife and six children in case you come round to my opinion remember that mr white could come over as he has done before for the operation so mr morgan believed i declined operating because i felt myself incapable very well i was much mortified an hour after we parted i received a note to this effect dear sir i will take the long round to-day to leave you at liberty to attend to Brownker's case which i feel to be a very responsible one j morgan this was kindly done i went back as soon as i could to john's cottage while i was in the inner room with him i heard the miss tomkinson's voices outside they had called to inquire miss tomkinson came in and evidently was poking and snuffling about mrs brouncker told her that i was within and within i resolved to be till they had gone what is this close smell asked she i am afraid you are not cleanly cheese cheese in this cupboard no wonder there is an unpleasant smell don't you know how particular you should be about being clean when there is illness about mrs brouncker was exquisitely clean in general and was piqued at these remarks if you please ma'am i could not leave john yesterday to do any housework and jenny put the dinner things away she is but eight years old but this did not satisfy miss tomkinson who was evidently pursuing the course of her observations fresh butter i declare well now mrs brouncker do you know i don't allow myself fresh butter at this time of the year how can you save indeed with such extravagance please ma'am answered mrs brouncker you'd think it strange if i was to take such liberties in your house as you are taking here i expected to hear a sharp answer no miss tomkinson liked true plain speaking the only person in whom she would tolerate roundabout ways of talking was her sister well that's true she said still you must not be above taking advice fresh butter is extravagant at this time of the year however you're a good kind of woman and i've a great respect for john send jenny for some broth as soon as he can take it come caroline we have got to go on to williams's but miss caroline said that she was tired and would rest where she was till miss tomkinson came back i was a prisoner for some time i found when she was alone with mrs brouncker she said you must not be hurt by my sister's abrupt manner she means well she has not much imagination or sympathy and cannot understand the distraction of mind produced by the illness of a worshipped husband i could hear the loud sigh of commiseration which followed this speech mrs brouncker said please ma'am i don't worship my husband i would not be so wicked goodness you don't think it wicked do you for my part if i should worship i should adore him i thought she need not imagine such improbable cases but sturdy mrs brouncker said again i hope i know my duty better i've not learnt my commandments for nothing i know whom i ought to worship just then the children came in dirty and unwashed i have no doubt and now miss caroline's real nature peeped out she spoke sharply to them and asked them if they had no manners little pigs as they were to come brushing against her silk gown in that way she sweetened herself again and was as sugary as love when miss tomkinson returned for her accompanied by one whose voice like winds in summer sighing i knew to be my dear sophie's she did not say much but what she did say and the manner in which she spoke was tender and compassionate in the highest degree 
and she came to take the four little ones back with her to the vicarage in order that they might be out of their mother's way the older two might help at home she offered to wash their hands and faces and when i emerged from my inner chamber after the miss tomkinsons had left i found her with a chubby child on her knees bubbling and sputtering against her white wet hand with a face bright rosy and merry under the operation just as i came in she said to him there jemmy now i can kiss you with this nice clean face she coloured when she saw me i liked her speaking and i liked her silence she was silent now and i loved all the better i gave my directions to mrs brownker and hastened to overtake sophie and the children but they had gone round by the lanes i suppose for i saw nothing of them i was very anxious about the case at night i went again miss horseman had been there i believe she was really kind among the poor but she could not help leaving a sting behind her everywhere she had been frightening mrs brownker about her husband and been i have no doubt expressing her doubts of my skill for mrs brownker began oh please sir if you'll only let mr morgan take off his arm i will never think the worse of you for not being able to do it i told her it was from no doubt of my own competency to perform the operation that i wished to save the arm but that he himself was anxious to have it spared ay bless him he frets about not earning enough to keep us if he's crippled but sir i don't care about that i would work my fingers to the bone and so would the children i'm sure we'd be proud to do for him and keep him god bless him it would be far better to have him only with one arm than to have him in the churchyard miss horseman says confound miss horseman said i thank you mr harrison said her well-known voice behind me she had come out dark as it was to bring some old linen to mrs brownker for as i said before she was very kind to all the poor people of duncombe i beg your pardon for i really was sorry for my speech or rather that she had heard it there is no occasion for any apology she replied drawing herself up and pinching her lips into a very venomous shape john was doing pretty well but of course the danger of locked jaw was not over before i left his wife entreated me to take off the arm she wrung her hands in her passionate entreaty spare him to me mr harrison she implored miss horseman stood by it was mortifying enough but i thought of the power which was in my hands as i firmly believed of saving the limb and i was inflexible you cannot think how pleasantly mrs rose's sympathy came in on my return to be sure she did not understand one word of the case which i detailed to her but she listened with interest and as long as she held her tongue i thought she was really taking it in but her first remark was as mal propos as could be you are anxious to save the tibia i see completely how difficult that will be my late husband had a case exactly similar and i remember his anxiety but you must not distress yourself too much my dear mr harrison i have no doubt it will end well i knew she had no grounds for this assurance and yet it comforted me however as it happened john did fully as well as i could hope of course he was long in rallying his strength and indeed sea air was evidently so necessary for his complete restoration that i accepted with gratitude mrs rose's proposal of sending him to highport for a fortnight or three weeks her kind generosity in this matter made me more desirous than ever of paying her every mark of respect and attention chapter fifteen 
about this time there was a sale at ash meadow a pretty house in the neighbourhood of duncombe it was likewise an easy walk and the spring days tempted many people thither who had no intention of buying anything but who liked the idea of rambling through the woods gay with early primroses and wild daffodils and of seeing the gardens and house which till now had been shut up from the ingress of the townspeople mrs rose had planned to go but an unlucky cold prevented her she begged me to bring her a very particular account saying she delighted in details and always questioned the late mr rose as to the side dishes of the dinners to which she went the late mr rose's conduct was always held up as a model to me by the way i walked to ash meadow pausing or loitering with different parties of townspeople all bound in the same direction at last i found the vicar and sophie and with them i stayed i sat by sophie and talked and listened a sale is a very pleasant gathering after all the auctioneer in a country place is privileged to joke from his rostrum and having a personal knowledge of most of the people can sometimes make a very keen hit at their circumstances and turn the laugh against them for instance on the present occasion there was a farmer present with his wife who was notoriously the grey mare the auctioneer was selling some horse-cloths and called out to recommend the article to her telling her with a knowing look at the company that they would make her a dashing pair of trousers if she was in want of such an article she drew herself up with dignity and said come john we've had enough of these whereupon there was a burst of laughter and in the midst of it john meekly followed his wife out of the place the furniture in the sitting-room was i believe very beautiful but i did not notice it much suddenly i heard the auctioneer speaking to me mr harrison won't you give me a bid for this table it was a very pretty little table of walnut wood i thought it would go into my study very well so i gave him a bid i saw miss horseman bidding against me so i went off with full force and at last it was knocked down to me the auctioneer smiled and congratulated me a most useful present for mrs harrison when that lady comes everybody laughed they like a joke about marriage it is so easy of comprehension but the table which i had thought was for writing turned out to be a work table scissors and thimble complete no wonder i looked foolish sophie was not looking at me that was one comfort she was busy arranging a nosegay of wood and enemy and wild sorrel miss horseman came up with her curious eyes i had no idea things were far enough advanced for you to be purchasing a work table mr harrison i laughed off my awkwardness did not you miss horseman you are very much behindhand you have not heard of my piano then no indeed said she half uncertain whether i was serious or not then it seems there is nothing wanting but the lady perhaps she may not be wanting either said i for i wished to perplex her keen curiosity chapter sixteen when i got home from my round i found mrs rose in some sorrow miss horseman called after you left said she have you heard how john brownker is at highport very well replied i i called on his wife just now and she had just got a letter from him she had been anxious about him for she had not heard for a week however all's right now and she has pretty well of work at mrs munton's as her servant is ill oh they'll do never fear at mrs munton's oh that accounts for it then she is so deaf and makes such blunders accounts for what asked i oh perhaps i had better not tell you hesitated mrs rose yes tell me at once 
i beg your pardon but i hate mysteries you are so like my poor dear mr rose he used to speak to me in just that sharp cross way it is only that miss horseman called she had been making a collection for john brouncker's widow and but the man's alive said i so it seems but mrs munton had told her that he was dead and she has got mr morgan's name down at the head of the list and mr bullock's mr morgan and i had got into a short cool way of speaking to each other ever since we had differed so much about the treatment of brouncker's arm and i had heard once or twice of his shakes of the head over john's case he would not have spoken against my method for the world and fancied that he concealed his fears miss horseman is very ill-natured i think sighed forth mrs rose i saw that something had been said of which i had not heard for the mere fact of collecting money for the widow was good-natured whoever did it so i asked quietly what she had said oh i don't know if i should tell you i only know she made me cry for i am not well and i can't bear to hear anyone i live with abused come this was pretty plain what did miss horseman say of me asked i half laughing for i knew there was no love lost between us oh she only said she wondered you could go to sales and spend your money there when your ignorance had made jane brouncker a widow and her children fatherless pooh pooh john's alive and likely to live as long as you or i thanks to you mrs rose when my work-table came home mrs rose was so struck with its beauty and completeness and i was so much obliged to her for her identification of my interests with hers and the kindness of her whole conduct about john that i begged her to accept of it she seemed very much pleased and after a few apologies she consented to take it and placed it in the most conspicuous part of the front parlour where she usually sat there was a good deal of morning calling in duncombe after the sale and during this time the fact of john's being alive was established to the conviction of all except miss horseman who i believe still doubted i myself told mr morgan who immediately went to reclaim his money saying to me that he was thankful of the information he was truly glad to hear it and he shook me warmly by the hand for the first time in a month chapter seventeen a few days after the sale i was in the consulting room the servant must have left the folding doors a little ajar i think mrs munton came to call on mrs rose and the former being deaf i heard all the speeches of the latter lady as she was obliged to speak very loudly in order to be heard she began this is a great pleasure mrs munton so seldom as you are well enough to go out mumble 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 through the door oh very well thank you take this seat and then you can admire my new work-table ma'am a present from mr harrison mumble mumble who could have told you ma'am miss horseman oh yes i showed it miss horseman mumble mumble i don't quite understand you ma'am mumble mumble i'm not blushing i believe i really am quite in the dark as to what you mean mumble mumble oh yes mr harrison and i are most comfortable together he reminds me so of my dear mr rose just as fidgety and anxious in his profession mumble mumble i am sure you are joking now ma'am then i heard a pretty loud oh no mumble 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 for a long time did he really well i am sure i don't know i should be sorry to think he was doomed to be unfortunate in so serious an affair but you know my undying regard for the late mr rose another long mumble you're very kind i'm sure mr rose always thought more of my happiness than his own a little crying 
but the turtle dove has always been my ideal ma'am mumble mumble no one could have been happier than i as you say it is a compliment to matrimony mumble oh but you must not repeat such a thing mr harrison would not like it he can't bear to have his affairs spoken about then there was a change of subject an inquiry after some poor person i imagine i heard mrs rose say she has got a mucous membrane i'm afraid ma'am a commiserating mumble not always fatal i believe mr rose knew some cases that lived for years after it was discovered that they had a mucous membrane a pause then mrs rose spoke in a different tone are you sure ma'am there is no mistake about what he said mumble pray don't be so observant mrs munton you find out too much one can have no little secrets the call broke up and i heard mrs munton say in the passage i wish you joy ma'am with all my heart there's no use denying it for i've seen all along what would happen when i went in to dinner i said to mrs rose you've had mrs munton here i think did she bring any news to my surprise she bridled and simpered and replied oh you must not ask mr harrison such foolish reports i did not ask as she seemed to wish me not and i knew there were silly reports always about then i think she was vexed that i did not ask altogether she went on so strangely that i could not help looking at her and then she took up a hand screen and held it between me and her i really felt rather anxiously are you not feeling well said i innocently oh thank you i believe i'm quite well only the room is rather warm is it not let me put the blinds down for you the sun begins to have a good deal of power i drew down the blinds you are so attentive mr harrison mr rose himself never did more for my little wishes than you do i wish i could do more i wish i could show you how much i feel her kindness to john brouncker i was going on to say but i was just then called out to a patient before i went i turned back and said take care of yourself my dear mrs rose you had better rest a little for your sake i will she said tenderly i did not care for whose sake she did it only i really thought she was not quite well and required rest i thought she was more affected than usual at tea-time and could have been angry with her nonsensical ways once or twice but that i knew the real goodness of her heart she said she wished she had the power to sweeten my life as she could my tea i told her what a comfort she had been all during my late time of anxiety and then i stole out to try if i could hear the evening singing at the vicarage by standing close to the garden wall chapter eighteen the next morning i met mr bullock by appointment to talk a little about the legacy which was paid into his hands as i was leaving his office feeling full of my riches i met miss horseman she smiled rather grimly and said oh mr harrison i must congratulate i believe i don't know whether i ought to have known but as i do i must wish you joy a very nice little sum too i always said you would have money so she had found out my legacy had she well it was no secret and one likes the reputation of being a person of property accordingly i smiled and said i was much obliged to her and if i could alter the figures to my liking she might congratulate me still more she said oh mr harrison you can't have everything it would be better the other way certainly money is the great thing as you found out the relation died most opportunely i must say he was no relative said i only an intimate friend dear ah me i thought it had been a brother 
well at any rate the legacy is safe i wished her good morning and passed on before long i was sent for to miss tomkinson's miss tomkinson sat in severe state to receive me i went in with an air of ease because i always felt too uncomfortable is this true that i hear asked she in an inquisitorial manner i thought she alluded to my five hundred pounds so i smiled and said that i believed it was can money be so great an object with you mr harrison she asked again i said i had never cared much for money except as an assistance to any plan of settling in life and then as i did not like her severe way of treating the subject i said that i hoped every one was well though of course i expected some one was ill or i should not have been sent for miss tomkinson looked very grave and sad then she answered caroline is very poorly the old palpitations at the heart but of course that is nothing to you i said i was very sorry she had a weakness there i knew could i see her i might be able to order something for her i thought i heard miss tomkinson say something in a low voice about my being a heartless deceiver then she spoke up i was always distrustful of you mr harrison i never liked your looks i begged caroline again and again not to confide in you i foresaw how it would end and now i fear her precious life will be a sacrifice i begged her not to distress herself for in all probability there was very little the matter with her sister might i see her no she said shortly standing up as if to dismiss me there has been too much of the seeing and calling by my consent you shall never see her again i bowed i was annoyed of course such a dismissal might injure my practice just when i was most anxious to increase it have you no apology no excuse to offer i said i had done my best i did not feel that there was any reason to offer an apology i wished her good morning suddenly she came forward oh mr harrison said she if you have really loved caroline do not let a little paltry money make you desert her for another i was struck dumb loved miss caroline i loved miss tomkinson a great deal better and yet i disliked her she went on i have saved nearly three thousand pounds if you think you are too poor to marry without money i will give it all to caroline i am strong and can go on working but she is weak and this disappointment will kill her she sat down suddenly and covered her face with her hands then she looked up you are unwilling i see don't suppose i would have urged you if it had been for myself but she has had so much sorrow and now she fairly cried aloud i tried to explain but she would not listen but kept saying leave the house sir leave the house but i would be heard i have never had any feelings warmer than respect for miss caroline and i have never shown any different feeling i never for an instant thought of making her my wife and she has had no cause in my behaviour to imagine i entertain any such intention this is adding insult to injury said she leave the house sir this instant chapter nineteen i went sadly enough in a small town such an occurrence is sure to be talked about and to make a great deal of mischief when i went home to dinner i was so full of it and foresaw so clearly that i should need some advocate soon to set the case in its right light that i determined on making a confidant of good mrs rose i could not eat she watched me tenderly and sighed when she saw my want of appetite i am sure you have something on your mind mr harrison would it be would it not be a relief to impart it to some sympathizing friend it was just what i wanted to do my dear kind mrs rose said i 
I must tell you if you will listen. She took up the fire screen and held it as yesterday between me and her. The most unfortunate misunderstanding has taken place. Miss Tomkinson thinks that I have been paying attentions to Miss Caroline, when, in fact, may I tell you, Mrs. Rose, my affections are placed elsewhere. Perhaps you have found it out already, for indeed I thought I had been too much in love to conceal my attachment to Sophie from any one who knew my movements as well as Mrs. Rose. She hung down her head and said she believed she had found out my secret. Then only think how miserably I am situated. If I have any hope, oh, Mrs. Rose, do you think I have any hope? She put the hand screen still more before her face, and after some hesitation, she said she thought, if I persevered, in time I might have hope and then she suddenly got up and left the room. Chapter 20 That afternoon I met Mr. Bullock in the street. My mind was so full of the affair with Miss Tomkinson that I should have passed him without notice if he had not stopped me short and said that he must speak to me about my wonderful five hundred pounds, I supposed. But I did not care for that now. What is this I hear, said he severely, about your engagement with Mrs. Rose? With Mrs. Rose, said I, almost laughing, although my heart was heavy enough. Yes, with Mrs. Rose, said he sternly. I'm not engaged to Mrs. Rose, I replied. There is some mistake. I'm glad to hear it, sir, he answered, very glad. It requires some explanation, however. Mrs. Rose has been congratulated and has acknowledged the truth of the report. It is confirmed by many facts. The work table you bought, confessing your intention of giving it to your future wife, is given to her. How do you account for these things, sir? I said I did not pretend to account for them. At present a good deal was inexplicable, and when I could give an explanation, I did not think that I should feel myself called upon to give it to him. Very well, sir, very well, replied he, growing very red. I shall take care and let Mr. Morgan know the opinion I entertain of you. What do you think that a man deserves to be called who enters a family under the plea of friendship and takes advantage of his intimacy to win the affections of the daughter and then engages himself to another woman? I thought he referred to Miss Caroline. I simply said, I could only say that I was not engaged, and that Miss Tomkinson had been quite mistaken in supposing I had been paying any attentions to her sister beyond those dictated by mere civility. Miss Tomkinson? Miss Caroline? I don't understand to what you refer. Is there another victim of your perfidy? What I allude to are the attentions you have paid to my daughter, Miss Bullock. Another, I could but disclaim, as I had done in the case of Miss Caroline. But I began to be in despair. Would Miss Horseman, too, come forward as a victim to my tender affections? It was all Mr. Morgan's doing, who had lectured me into this tenderly deferential manner. But on the score of Miss Bullock, I was brave in my innocence. I had positively disliked her, and so I told her father, though in more civil and measured terms, adding that I was sure the feeling was reciprocal. He looked as if he would like to horsewhip me. I longed to call him out. I hope my daughter has had sense enough to despise you. I hope she has, that's all. I trust my wife may be mistaken as to her feelings. So. He had heard all through the medium of his wife. That explained something, and rather calmed me. I begged he would ask Miss Bullock if she ever thought that I had any ulterior objective in my intercourse with her, beyond mere friendliness, and not so much of that I might have added. I would refer it to her. 
girls said mr bullock a little more quietly do not like to acknowledge that they have been deceived and disappointed i consider my wife's testimony as likely to be nearer the truth than my daughter's for that reason and she tells me she never doubted but that if not absolutely engaged you understood each other perfectly she is sure jemima is deeply wounded by your engagement to mrs rose once for all i am not engaged to anybody till you have seen your daughter and learnt the truth from her i will wish you farewell i bowed in a stiff haughty manner and walked off homewards but when i got to my own door i remembered mrs rose and all that mr bullock had said about her acknowledging the truth of the report of my engagement to her where could i go to be safe mrs rose miss bullock miss caroline they lived as it were at the three points of an equilateral triangle here was i in the centre i would go to mr morgan's and drink tea with him there at any rate i was secure from any one wanting to marry me and i might be as professionally bland as i liked without being misunderstood but there too a contretemps awaited me chapter twenty one mr morgan was looking grave and after a minute or two of humming and hawing he said i have been sent for to miss caroline tomkinson mr harrison i am sorry to hear of this i am grieved to find that there seems to have been some trifling with the affections of a very worthy lady miss tomkinson who is in sad distress tells me that they had every reason to believe that you were attached to her sister may i ask if you do not intend to marry her i said nothing was farther from my thoughts my dear sir said mr morgan rather agitated do not express yourself so strongly and vehemently it is derogatory to the sex to speak so it is more respectful to say in these cases that you do not venture to entertain a hope such a manner is generally understood and does not sound like such positive objection i cannot help it sir i must talk in my own natural manner i would not speak disrespectfully of any woman but nothing should induce me to marry miss caroline tomkinson not if she were venus herself and queen of england into the bargain i cannot understand what has given rise to the idea indeed sir i think that is very plain you have a trifling case to attend to in the house and you invariably make it a pretext for seeing and conversing with the lady that was her doing not mine said i vehemently allow me to go on you are discovered on your knees before her a positive injury to the establishment as miss tomkinson observes a most passionate valentine is sent and when questioned you acknowledge the sincerity of meaning which you affix to such things he stopped for in his earnestness he had been talking more quickly than usual and was out of breath i burst in with my explanations the valentine i knew nothing about it is in your handwriting said he coldly i should be most deeply grieved to in fact i will not think it possible of your father's son but i must say it is in your handwriting i tried again and at last succeeded in convincing him that i had been only unfortunate not intentionally guilty of winning miss caroline's affections i said that i had been endeavouring it was true to practise the manner he had recommended of universal sympathy and recalled to his mind some of the advice he had given me he was a good deal hurried but my dear sir i had no idea you would carry it out to such consequences philandering miss tomkinson called it that is a hard word sir my manner has been always tender and sympathetic but i am not aware that i ever excited any hopes there never was any report about me i believe no lady has ever attached to me you must strive after this happy medium sir i was still distressed 
Mr. Morgan had only heard of one, but there were three ladies, including Miss Bullock, hoping to marry me. He saw my annoyance. Don't be too much distressed about it, my dear sir. I was sure you were too honourable a man from the first. With a conscience like yours, I would defy the world. He became anxious to console me, and I was hesitating whether I would not tell him all my three dilemmas when a note was brought in to him. It was from Mrs. Munton. He threw it to me with a face of dismay. My dear Mr. Morgan, I most sincerely congratulate you on the happy matrimonial engagement I hear you have formed with Miss Tomkinson. All previous circumstances, as I have just been remarking to Miss Horseman, combine to promise you felicity, and I wish that every blessing may attend your married life. Most sincerely, yours, Jane Munton. I could not help laughing. He had been so lately congratulating himself that no report of the kind had ever been circulated about himself. He said, Sir, this is no laughing matter. I assure you it is not. I could not resist asking, if I was to conclude that there was no truth in the report. Truth, sir? It's a lie from beginning to end. I don't like to speak too decidedly about any lady, and I've a great respect for Miss Tomkinson, but I do assure you, sir, I'd as soon marry one of Her Majesty's lifeguards. I would rather. It would be more suitable. Miss Tomkinson is a very worthy lady, but she's a perfect grenadier. He grew very nervous. He was evidently insecure. He thought it not impossible that Miss Tomkinson might come and marry him vi et armis. I am sure he had some dim idea of abduction in his mind. Still, he was better off than I was, for he was in his own house, and report had only engaged him to one lady, while I stood like Paris among three contending beauties. Truly, an apple of discord had been thrown into our little town. I suspected at the time what I know now that it was Miss Horseman's doing. Not intentionally, I will do her the justice to say, but she had shouted out the story of my behaviour to Miss Caroline up Mrs. Munton's trumpet, and that lady, possessed with the idea that I was engaged to Mrs. Rose, had imagined the masculine pronoun to relate to Mr. Morgan, whom she had seen only that afternoon tete-a-tete -tete with Miss Tomkinson condoling with her in some tender deferential manner i'll be bound chapter twenty two i was very cowardly i positively dared not go home but at length i was obliged to go i had done all i could to console mr morgan but he refused to be comforted i went at last i rang at the bell i don't know who opened the door but i think it was mrs rose I kept a handkerchief to my face, and, muttering something about having a dreadful toothache, I flew up to my room and bolted the door. I had no candle, but what did that signify? I was safe. I could not sleep, and when I did fall into a sort of doze, it was ten times worse wakening up. I could not remember whether I was engaged or not. If I was engaged, who was the lady? I had always considered myself as rather plain than otherwise, but surely I had made a mistake. Fascinating I certainly must be, but perhaps I was handsome. As soon as day dawned, I got up to ascertain the fact at the looking-glass. Even with the best disposition to be convinced, I could not see any striking beauty in my round face with an unshaven beard and a nightcap like a fool's cap at the top. I took off my nightcap. No, I must be content to be plain, but agreeable. All this I tell you in confidence. I would not have my little bit of vanity known for the world. I fell asleep towards morning. 
I was awakened by a tap at my door. It was Peggy. She put in a hand with a note. I took it. It is not from Miss Horseman, said I, half in joke, half in very earnest fright. No, sir, Mr. Morgan's man brought it. I opened it. It ran thus. My dear sir, it is now nearly twenty years since I have had a little relaxation, and I find that my health requires it. I have also the utmost confidence in you, and I am sure this feeling is shared by our patients. I have, therefore, no scruple in putting in execution a hastily formed plan, and going to Chesterton to catch the early train on my way to Paris. If your accounts are good, I shall remain away, probably, a fortnight. Direct to Muris's. Yours most truly, J. Morgan. P.S. Perhaps it may be well not to name where I am gone, especially to Miss Tomkinson. He had deserted me. He, with only one report, had left me to stand my ground with three. Mrs. Rose's kind regards, sir, and it's nearly nine o'clock. Breakfast has been ready this hour, sir. Tell Mrs. Rose I don't want any breakfast, or stay, for I was very hungry. I will take a cup of tea and some toast up here. Peggy brought the tray to the door. I hope you're not ill, sir, said she kindly. Not very. I shall be better when I get into the air. Mrs. Rose seems sadly put about, said she. She seems so grieved like. I watched my opportunity and went out by the side door in the garden. Chapter 23 I had intended to ask Mr. Morgan to call at the vicarage and give his parting explanation before they could hear the report. Now I thought that if I could see Sophie I would speak to her myself, but I did not wish to encounter the vicar. I went along the lane at the back of the vicarage and came suddenly upon Miss Bullock. She coloured and asked me if I would allow her to speak to me. I could only be resigned, but I thought I could probably set one report at rest by this conversation. She was almost crying. I must tell you, Mr. Harrison, I have watched you here in order to speak to you. I heard with the greatest regret of Papa's conversation with you yesterday. She was fairly crying. I believe Mrs. Bullock finds me in her way, and wants to have me married. It is the only way in which I can account for such a complete misrepresentation as she has told Papa. I don't care for you in the least, sir. You never paid me any attentions. You've been almost rude to me, and I have liked you the better. That's to say, I never have liked you. I am truly glad to hear what you say, answered I. Don't distress yourself. I was sure there was some mistake. But, she cried bitterly, it is so hard to feel that my marriage, my absence, is desired so earnestly at home. I dread every new acquaintance we form with any gentleman. It is sure to be the beginning of a series of attacks on him, of which everybody must be aware, and to which they may think I am a willing party but I should not much mind if it were not for the conviction that she wishes me so earnestly away. Oh, my own dear mamma, you would never. She cried more than ever. I was truly sorry for her, and had just taken her hand and began, My dear Miss Bullock, when the door in the wall of the vicarage garden opened. It was the vicar letting out Miss Tomkinson whose face was all swelled with crying. He saw me, but he did not bow or make any sign. On the contrary, he looked down as from a severe eminence and shut the door hastily. I turned to Miss Bullock. I'm afraid the vicar has been hearing something to my disadvantage from Miss Tomkinson, and it is very awkward, she finished my sentence, to have found us here together 
yes but as long as we understand that we do not care for each other it does not signify what people say oh but to me it does said i i may perhaps tell you but do not mention it to a creature i am attached to miss hutton to sophie oh mr harrison i am so glad she is such a sweet creature oh i wish you joy not yet i have never spoken about it oh but it is certain to happen she jumped with a woman's rapidity to a conclusion and then she began to praise sophie never was a man yet who did not like to hear the praises of his mistress i walked by her side we came past the front of the vicarage together i looked up and saw sophie there and she saw me that afternoon she was sent away sent to visit her aunt ostensibly in reality because of the reports of my conduct which were showered down upon the vicar and one of which he saw confirmed by his own eyes chapter twenty four i heard of sophie's departure as one heard of everything soon after it had taken place i did not care for the awkwardness of my situation which had so perplexed and amused me in the morning i felt that something was wrong that sophie was taken away from me i sank into despair if anybody likes to marry me they might i was willing to be sacrificed i did not speak to mrs rose she wondered at me and grieved over my coldness i saw but i had left off feeling anything miss tomkinson cut me in the street and it did not break my heart sophie was gone away that was all i cared for where had they sent her to who was her aunt that she should go and visit her one day i met lizzie who looked as though she had been told not to speak to me but could not help doing so have you heard from your sister said i yes where is she i hope she is well she is at the leoms i was not much wiser oh yes she is very well fanny says she was at the assembly last wednesday and danced all night with the officers i thought i would enter myself a member of the peace society at once she was a little flirt and a hard-hearted creature i don't think i wished lizzie good-bye chapter twenty five what most people would have considered a more serious evil than sophie's absence befell me i found that my practice was falling off the prejudice of the town ran strongly against me mrs munton told me all that was said she heard it through miss horseman it was said cruel little town that my negligence or ignorance had been the cause of walter's death that miss tyrrell had become worse under my treatment and that john brouncker was all but dead if he was not quite from my mismanagement all jack marshland's jokes and revelations which had i thought gone to oblivion were raked up to my discredit he himself formerly to my astonishment rather a favourite with the good people of duncombe was spoken of as one of my disreputable friends in short so prejudiced were the good people of duncombe that i believe a very little would have made them suspect me of a brutal highway robbery which took place in the neighbourhood about this time mrs munton told me a propos of the robbery that she had never yet understood the cause of my year's imprisonment in newgate she had no doubt from what mr morgan had told her there was some good reason for it but if i would tell her the particulars she should like to know them miss tomkinson sent for mr white from chesterton to see miss caroline and as he was coming over all our old patients seemed to take advantage of it and sent for him too but the worst of all was the vicar's manner to me if he had cut me i could have asked him why he did so but the freezing change in his behaviour was indescribable 
though bitterly felt i heard of sophie's gaiety from lizzie i thought of writing to her just then mr morgan's fortnight of absence expired i was wearied out by mrs rose's tender vagaries and took no comfort from her sympathy which indeed i rather avoided her tears irritated instead of grieving me i wished i could tell her at once that i had no intention of marrying her chapter twenty six mr morgan had not been at home above two hours before he was sent for to the vicarage sophie had come back and i had never heard of it she had come home ill and weary and longing for rest and the rest seemed approaching with awful strides mr morgan forgot all his parisian adventures and all his terrors of miss tomkinson when he was sent for to see her she was ill of a fever which made fearful progress when he told me i wished to force the vicarage door if i might but see her but i controlled myself and only cursed my weak indecision which had prevented my writing to her it was well i had no patience they would have had but a poor chance of attention i hung about mr morgan who might see her and did see her but from what he told me i perceived that the measures he was adopting were powerless to check so sudden and violent an illness oh if they would but let me see her but that was out of the question it was not merely that the vicar had heard of my character as a gay lothario but that doubts had been thrown out of my medical skill the accounts grew worse suddenly my resolution was taken mr morgan's very regard for sophie made him more than usually timid in his practice i had my horse saddled and galloped to chesterton i took the express train to town i went to see dr a i told him every particular of the case he listened but shook his head he wrote down the prescription and recommended a new preparation not yet in full use a preparation of a poison in fact it may save her said he it is a chance in such a state of things as you describe it must be given on the fifth day if the pulse will bear it crab makes up the preparation most skilfully let me hear from you i beg i went to crab's i begged to make it up myself but my hands trembled so that i could not weigh the quantities i asked the young man to do it for me i went without touching food to the station with my medicine and my prescription in my pocket back we flew through the country i sprang on bay malden which my groom had in waiting and galloped across the country to duncombe but i drew bridle when i came to the top of the hill the hill above the old hall from which we catch the first glimpse of the town for i thought within myself that she might be dead and i dreaded to come near certainty the hawthorns were out in the woods the young lambs were in the meadows the song of the thrushes filled the air but it only made the thought the more terrible what if in this world of hope and life she lies dead i heard the church bells soft and clear i sickened to listen was it the passing bell no it was ringing eight o'clock i put spurs to my horse down hill as it was we dashed into the town i turned him saddle and bridle into the stable yard and went off to mr morgan's is she said i how is she very ill my poor fellow i see how it is with you she may live but i fear my dear sir i am very much afraid i told him of my journey and consultation with dr a and showed him the prescription his hands trembled as he put on his spectacles to read it this is a very dangerous medicine sir said he with his finger under the name of the poison it is a new preparation said i dr a relies much upon it 
i dare not administer it he replied i have never tried it it must be very powerful i dare not play tricks in this case i believe i stamped with impatience but it was all of no use my journey had been in vain the more i urged the imminent danger of the case requiring some powerful remedy the more nervous he became i told him i would throw up the partnership i threatened him with that though in fact it was only what i felt i ought to do and had resolved upon before sophie's illness as i had lost the confidence of his patience he only said i cannot help it sir i shall regret it for your father's sake but i must do my duty i dare not run the risk of giving miss sophie this violent medicine a preparation of a deadly poison i left him without a word he was quite right in adhering to his own views as i can see now but at the time i thought him brutal and obstinate chapter twenty seven i went home i spoke rudely to mrs rose who awaited my return at the door i rushed past and locked myself in my room i could not go to bed the morning sun came pouring in and enraged me as everything did since mr morgan refused i pulled the blind down so violently that the string broke what did it signify the light might come in what was the sun to me and then i remembered that the sun might be shining on her dead i sat down and covered my face mrs rose knocked at the door i opened it she had never been in bed and had been crying too mr morgan wants to speak to you sir i rushed back for my medicine and went to him he stood at the door pale and anxious she's alive sir said he but that's all we have sent for dr hamilton i'm afraid he will not come in time do you know sir i think we should venture with dr a's sanction to give her that medicine it is but a chance but it is the only one i'm afraid he fairly cried before he had ended i've got it here said i setting off to walk but he could not go so fast i beg your pardon sir said he for my abrupt refusal last night indeed sir said i i ought much rather to beg your pardon i was very violent oh never mind never mind will you repeat what dr a said i did so and then i asked with a meekness that astonished myself if i might not go in and administer it no sir said he i'm afraid not i'm sure your good heart would not wish to give pain besides it might agitate her if she has any consciousness before death in her delirium she has often mentioned your name and sir i'm sure you won't name it again as it may in fact be considered a professional secret but i did hear our good vicar speak a little strongly about you in fact sir i did hear him curse you you see the mischief it might make in the parish i'm sure if this were known i gave him the medicine and watched him and saw the door shut i hung about the place all day poor and rich all came to inquire the country people drove up in their carriages the halt and the lame came on their crutches their anxiety did my heart good mr morgan told me that she slept and i watched dr hamilton into the house the night came on she slept i watched round the house i saw the light high up burning still and steady then i saw it moved it was the crisis in one way or other chapter twenty eight mr morgan came out good old man the tears were running down his cheeks he could not speak but kept shaking my hands i did not want words i understood that she was better dr hamilton says it was the only medicine that could have saved her 
I was an old fool, sir, I beg your pardon. The vicar shall know all. I beg your pardon, sir, if I was abrupt. Everything went on brilliantly from this time. Mr. Bullock came to apologise for his mistake and consequent upbraiding. John Brownker came home, brave and well. There was still Miss Tomkinson in the ranks of the enemy, and Mrs. Rose, too much, I feared, in the ranks of the friends. CHAPTER Twenty Nine. One night she had gone to bed, and I was thinking of going. I had been studying in the back room, where I went for refuge from her in the present position of affairs. I read a good number of surgical books about this time, and also Vanity Fair. When I heard a loud, continued knocking at the door, enough to waken the whole street, before I could get to open it, I heard that well-known bass of Jack Marshland's, once heard, never to be forgotten, pipe up the negro song, Who's that knocking at the door? Though it was raining hard at the time, I stood waiting to let him in. He would finish his melody in the open air, loud and clear along the street it sounded. I saw Miss Tomkinson's night-capped head emerge from a window. She called out, Police! Police! Now, there were no police, only a rheumatic constable in the town, but it was the custom of the ladies, when alarmed at night, to call an imaginary police, which had, they thought, an intimidating effect. But as every one knew the real state of the unwatched town, we did not much mind it in general. Just now, however, I wanted to regain my character, so I pulled Jack in, quavering as he entered. You've spoilt a good shake, said he, that's what you have. I'm nearly up to Jenny Lind, and you see I'm a nightingale like her. We sat up late, and I don't know how it was, but I told him all my matrimonial misadventures. I thought I could imitate your hand pretty well, said he. My word, it was a flaming valentine. No wonder she thought you loved her. So, that was your doing, was it? Now I'll tell you what you shall do to make up for it. You shall write me a letter confessing your hoax, a letter that I can show. Give me a pen and paper, my boy, you shall dictate. With a deeply penitent heart, Will that do for a beginning? I told him what to write, a simple, straightforward confession of his practical joke. I enclosed it in a few lines of regret that, unknown to me, any of my friends should have so acted. CHAPTER Thirty. All this time I knew that Sophie was slowly recovering. One day I met Miss Bullock, who had seen her. We have been talking about you, said she, with a bright smile, for since she knew I disliked her, she felt quite at her ease and could smile very pleasantly. I understood that she had been explaining the misunderstanding about herself to Sophie, so that when Jack Marshland's note had been sent to Miss Tomkinson, I thought myself in a fair way to have my character established in two quarters. But the third was my dilemma. Mrs. Rose had really so much of my true regard for her good qualities that I disliked the idea of a formal explanation in which a good deal must be said on my side to wound her. We had become very much estranged ever since I had heard of this report of my engagement to her. I saw that she grieved over it. While Jack Marshland stayed with us, I felt at my ease in the presence of a third person, but he told me confidentially he durst not stay long, for fear some of the ladies would snap him up and marry him. Indeed, I myself did not think it unlikely that he would snap one of them up if he could. For when we met Miss Bullock one day, and heard her hopeful, joyous account of Sophie's progress, to whom she was a daily visitor, he asked me who that bright-looking girl was. 
and when I told him she was the Miss Bullock of whom I had spoken to him, he was pleased to observe that he thought I had been a great fool, and asked me if Sophie had anything like such splendid eyes. He made me repeat about Miss Bullock's unhappy circumstances at home, and then became very thoughtful, a most unusual and morbid symptom in his case. Soon after he went, by Mr. Morgan's kind offices and explanations, I was permitted to see Sophie. I might not speak much. It was prohibited for fear of agitating her. We talked of the weather and the flowers, and we were silent. But her little white thin hand lay in mine, and we understood each other without words. I had a long interview with the vicar afterwards, and came away glad and satisfied. Mr. Morgan called in the afternoon, evidently anxious, though he made no direct inquiries. He was too polite for that, to hear the result of my visit at the vicarage. I told him to give me joy. He shook me warmly by the hand, and then rubbed his own together. I thought I would consult him about my dilemma with Mrs. Rose, who, I was afraid, would be deeply affected by my engagement. There is only one awkward circumstance, said I, about Mrs. Rose. I hesitated how to word the fact of her having received congratulations on her supposed engagement with me and her manifest attachment. But before I could speak, he broke in. My dear sir, you need not trouble yourself about that. She will have a home. In fact, sir, said he, reddening a little, I thought it would, perhaps, put a stop to those reports connecting my name with Miss Tomkinson's if I married someone else. I hoped it might prove an efficacious contradiction, and I was struck with admiration for Mrs. Rose's undying memory of her late husband. Not to be prolix, I have this morning obtained Mrs. Rose's consent to, to marry her, in fact, sir, said he, jerking out the climax. Here was an event. Then Mr. Morgan had never heard the report about Mrs. Rose and me. To this day I think she would have taken me if I had proposed. So much the better. Marriages were in the fashion that year. Mr. Bullock met me one morning, as I was going to ride with Sophie. He and I had quite got over our misunderstanding, thanks to Jemima, and we were as friendly as ever. This morning he was chuckling aloud as he walked. Stop, Mr. Harrison, he said, as I went quickly past. Have you heard the news? Miss Horseman has just told me Miss Caroline has eloped with young Hoggins. She is ten years older than he is. How can her gentility like being married to a tallow chandler? It is a very good thing for her, though, he added in a more serious manner. Old Hoggins is very rich, and though he's angry just now, he will soon be reconciled. Any vanity I might have entertained on the score of the three ladies who were at one time said to be captivated by my charms, was being rapidly dispersed. Soon after Mr. Hoggins's marriage, I met Miss Tomkinson face to face for the first time since our memorable conversation. She stopped me and said, Don't refuse to receive my congratulations, Mr. Harrison, on your most happy engagement to Miss Hutton. I owe you an apology, too, for my behaviour when I last saw you at our house. I really did think Caroline was attached to you then, and it irritated me, I confess, in a very wrong and unjustifiable way. But I heard her telling Mr. Hoggins only yesterday that she had been attached to him for years, ever since he was in pinafores she dated it from and when I asked her afterwards how she could say so after her distress on hearing that false report about you and Mrs. Rose, she cried and said I never had understood her, and that the hysterics which alarmed me so much were simply caused by eating pickled cucumber. 
i am very sorry for my stupidity and improper way of speaking but i hope we are friends now mr harrison for i should wish to be liked by sophie's husband good miss tomkinson to believe the substitution of indigestion for disappointed affection i shook her warmly by the hand and we have been all right ever since i think i told you she is the baby's godmother chapter thirty one i had some difficulty in persuading jack marshland to be groomsman but when he heard all the arrangements he came miss bullock was bridesmaid he liked us all so well that he came again at christmas and was far better behaved than he had been the year before he won golden opinions indeed miss tomkinson said he was a reformed young man we dined all together at mr morgan's the vicar wanted us to go there but from what sophie told me helen was not confident of the mincemeat and rather dreaded so large a party we had a jolly day of it mrs morgan was as kind and motherly as ever miss horseman certainly did set out a story that the vicar was thinking of miss tomkinson for his second or else i think we had no other report circulated in consequence of our happy merry christmas day and it is a wonder considering how jack marshland went on with jemima here's sophie come back from putting baby to bed and charles wakened up end of section nine and end of mr harrison's confessions by elizabeth gaskell